Hello, people. Let's see. Anybody here yet? Yeah, looks like a few of us. All right. Well, I've sent my link out to some other people who were maybe interested in hopping on. So we'll see if it's not just me this time. Um, as far as I can tell, it looks like everything is set up right. So yeah, this is it. This is the end of what was an incredible journey into um, this crazy person's, um, I guess, redefinition of femininity and masculinity in such a way that um, basically everything bad and evil needs to be rejected as the masculine. Um, but we're going to do this while simultaneously preserving and protecting the feminine. Which, um, as I explained in the, the fourth part, my theory is basically that this guy just has the typical, you know, male feminist, very rapey kind of tendencies within him. He projects it onto everyone else. And basically, this entire work, this entire series of essays, the whole point of it was to make himself feel better and like he's actually a more normal and well-adjusted person. Um, but then also to engage in this kind of feminist gatekeeping, where you come out ahead of any accusations against yourself, and then he gets to, like, define and set up the entire narrative in order to basically protect the grift. And hello, Red Raptor. Good to see ya. But yeah, um, I, uh, um, I invited, uh, Church of Entropy and Jadis to hop on. So maybe we'll see them. Um, and I also sent the link out to the usual suspects. Um, I'm not sure, looking back at some of these essays, if there's anything that I want to really revisit in particular, um, or, or ever, frankly. <laughs> um, maybe the one that would be the most, uh, that, that there's, maybe that, that I left the most kind of unchallenged would have been in the third part. But I just think most of that's just really stupid and irrelevant. I think that a lot of the people who go very hard in the anti-porn rhetoric, that it's, it's just really tiresome. Um, pretty much any issue you can point out with porn is non-unique to porn. It's really just an issue of addiction. Um, yeah, I think that if you like destigmatize porn then basically it turns into anything else, which just kind of becomes, like, mundane. And then people move on and find their own meaning. But I guess, um, you know, after looking through this, it leaves the question, um, like, what is masculinity? H how do you define it? And, 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 or should it be defined, right? There's all kinds of things presupposed by just asking the question. Um, and I'd take a somewhat radical stance, you know, when he comes out swinging saying, hey, we don't need the masculine and the feminine, let's all be non-binary, gender fluid people or whatever. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with that if that's what people, you know, want to do. Um, I think that a lot of people in like the more anti-SJW or conservative or like obviously traditionalist circles... They, they really take issue with that. They, they really, really don't like that idea. Um, frankly, I, I kind of just don't really care. I kind of think that it's, you know, let live and let live, right? Um, so, so I'm somebody who, you know, when he comes out defining things in such a way to say, let's not have a construction of the masculine and the feminine and let people be individual and do whatever they want, I, I, I think, okay, like, that, that's fine. If, and then where are you going to go with it? Um, but of course, the direction he took it in was one that essentially just defines masculinity as um, wife beating and raping. And that's it. <laughs> so, there, there's a few ways to approach it, right? Because on the one hand, we just look at the observed behaviors of men and women. And we say, oh, men tend to do this, women tend to do that. Um, you look at things from a societal level and ask yourself, like, what has worked, right? And um, I actually have a lot of skepticism towards that. I, um, I actually don't really think that individuals should be asked to, to sacrifice things for society. I think that if society can't protect basic individual rights, then 
why should the individual be asked to give anything up for society? Um, and and I, frankly, I think that m most human cultures are, um, are, are worthy of, of condemnation because of their treatment of men. Um, and I think that the traditionalist structure is basically man as house Negro. And a lot of the accusations that the women's movement has made towards society on behalf of women, a lot of it, it's not just untrue, but it is a 100% reversal. And I would say that you actually can um, take things as far in the direction that feminists have in, in condemnation, which I think, I think that's probably the best definition of a distinction between the radical MRA and, and the, the more, I guess, more, more typical, more mainstream, more, um, I guess, respectable <laughs> MRA. Um, I'm willing to, to push that narrative as far as I possibly can, because I find that time and time again, whenever I start to entertain these ideas, I find that it's actually easier to justify than I thought. And then I'm left thinking, maybe I haven't gone far enough yet. So yeah, um, Fuck the matriarchy. The matriarchy is oppressing men, and it's wrong, and it's evil. Oh, hey, someone else is in here. It's Jadis. How's it going? It's it's going. Unfortunately, the camera that it's I've got going, if you can even see me, is from my laptop. I don't know why it's not letting me use my Logitech, but whatever. Um, I have kind of bad news, and the bad news is I only got through one chapter, and the rest I didn't get to read because of my stupid work schedule. Um, oh, that's the exactly. problem. Yeah, I, okay. um, well, basically, yeah, I kind of went through it on the streams a little bit, and I figured for this one, I don't expect that, that necessarily everybody read through all of it or anything. I, I, I would just... have, uh, I literally would have read it, though, if, unfortunately, my stupid job didn't keep cutting four hours off my sleep schedule because every day this week they had me coming in four hours earlier. That's that's kind of yeah, impossible would, to get that things would screw done. me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I can't blame you. Well, and of course, um, I guess if you ever do peruse through it later and find some interesting thing to, to, to talk about with it or whatever. I, um, well, what I can say is that what I read, like the, the preface and, and the... Um, the introduction and and that first chapter was absolute shit. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I insane, I hated right? every bit of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So that and, was that was the thing is he's setting up like this epistemology that's very very you know that the postmodern everything is structurally defined right mm -hmm. and <laughs> I, I can imagine you probably took, took some issue with that as I think. Uh, pretty much yeah. Most. What's interesting is that this was written in 1988, I think it said, and it's. It's spot on to the the uh, the cult belief of of the woke left these days. It's it's like this is basically part of their Bible. So I guess this really is what they're teaching in gender studies. These are the a holes that took power and are indoctrinating our kids into thinking that there really are basically infinite genders. Yeah, well, and that's one of the things, too, is um, around this time last year, we were going through this old book that was published in 1992 called Women mm -hmm. Respond to the Men's Movement, which had a lot of these these similar themes in it, although that had more of like an eco-feminist angle because that was that that was the hot shit in like the early 90s <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but but it was a lot of cut from a lot of the same cloth. And like one thing is that so many people think that this whole like um, like, the, 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 like, woke, non-binary, SJWism, they think that it just burst into existence around, like, 2014. And mm -hmm. it, the point is, it, it really isn't true. It's It's been around for many decades, and it's had a long time to really um, seep into okay, everything. So I, I, I'm aware of that, and I saw bits of it when I was younger, and I've seen it sort of explode in popularity as I got older. And what I, what I think is, like, those the people that believe this crap, we sort of kept them at bay. We knew to make fun of them. We knew to sort of shame them in, into keeping to their little corner and stop trying to proselytize. So people knew not to take them seriously. But then it seems like at a certain point, we gave them a platform. We gave them a little soapbox and we started listening to them. 
that's when we had a real problem. And I think a lot of that is social media sort of be, the egalitarian nature of social media introduced to, uh, to people these ideas and they didn't know not to listen to them, you know, like culturally speaking, we knew that, um, what, what was it? Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen like old SNL or, or, uh, living color or any of those, uh, comedies, but they used to do little skits that made fun of these kinds of people and people knew to laugh. They, they knew this is absurd. Anyone that talks like this, don't take them seriously one bit. But then we didn't, we don't get that when you're just online and you're innocently just coming across it. There's no one to tell you, Hey, stay away from this. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm the first to say, you know, we should have freedom of speech and, you know, bad ideas are shut down with good ideas. But if you don't even know what the other arguments are, and that's the only thing you're being exposed to, being an introvert maybe, that can be a real problem. And so especially people that are uh, uh, introverted, they are already sort of isolated. And um, it makes them very easy to, to radicalize. So... Yeah, well, because I think that before, like, a lot of it was kind of, like, enshrined in, like, the ivory tower, right? So there was, so, like, it was in this space that kind of just wasn't really accessible and most people aren't really exposed to it. And then I think social media did give people a, a way to, like, it really amplifies the armchair activism, right? <laughs> and then a lot of um, these approaches, their their aim is to change and influence society. So I think that they probably had some advantage in, in trying to find ways to yeah. kind of create like a pop philosophy of it that they can throw all around social media which that, that also uh, might explain why the, why the, um, socialism and communism is on the rise and it, it also doesn't help that this is an era where it's not just the the right but also the left believes in the phenomenon that is fake news and as they believe in fake news they also distrust authority both left and right distrust authority. So whatever you're taught in school, they're like, well, yeah, they taught us that. Yeah, that was in our science class or that was in our history class, but can we really trust them? And they have their different reasons for, for doubting. And yeah, I think now it's, it's so much easier to radicalize people because who can you trust anymore? So people start uh, cherry picking and, and gathering whatever information they can online. And that leaves them very vulnerable. To, to radicalization. Yeah, um, I, I think that is part of it. I think that what's happened is, um, I mean, because it kind of goes both ways, right? Because you have kind of yeah, small absolutely, and esoteric yeah. things within the right and within like anti-feminism in particular. It, it, that um, you know, certainly that perspective gained a lot of traction through, through the ability of social media, and I think that's just going to create more and more polarization. So I, I guess yeah. I, I guess I'm okay with people. Um, with different perspectives all kind of getting thrown out there, even if it does become this, like, crazy Wild West. I think that there probably has been a little bit too much trust of authority um, in academia and everything. I don't know. I, I'd like to think that well, eventually the, the facts prevail. Well, I, I, I like the idea of teaching people to think critically. The problem is I don't think that that's really what's going on. So, like, by all means, expose people to, to ideas, a, a variety of ideas, good and bad ideas, but teach them to think critically. And I don't think, in fact, I know they're not teaching you to think critically. A lot of these ideas are being promoted by people who specifically teach you that to think critically is actually dangerous, that it's actually harmful to their cause. Yeah, That's the like problem. The uh, these, these, of, these um, people... Teaching how to think instead of what to think, right? Right. Oh, the, so did you did you ever read um, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianov's uh, The Cobbling of the American Mind? I never read it. I listened to some um, some height. Um, okay, so, I so, what, so there's like a certain like longer speech that or presentation he had done that everybody. Yeah, well, I mean, they also wrote some of this in, in I think the Atlantic could be wrong, um, but one of the things they talk about is catastrophizing. There's like the the language that a lot of these radicals will use is catastrophizing language. So everything is hyperbolic, and it's like it's is the worst. It is like, it's like, it gives you a sense that something is absolutely an imminent threat when it may, may not be, it might, maybe that's a problem, but it's not the worst thing in the world. It's something you can handle. 
and it, it conditions you to feel more vulnerable, more fragile, and you're going to react extra sensitive to it. And because of that kind of conditioning with this, this, uh, this radical ideology that w what we're encountering online, it becomes harder to uh, sort of uh, protect yourself against it. You can't really immunize yourself against it the way they sort of condition you. You really have to start off from a different background completely. You can't just go in cold turkey. Or, uh, that's a bad language. That was the wrong way to say it. You can't come in without any any knowledge ahead of time. You know, being like, hey, by the way, you, you need to examine this very carefully because the, these ideas are are potentially dangerous. Or do you know what I'm saying? No, yeah. You, you need to know ahead of time that these. Uh, like in high school policy debate, the joke is that um, on either side, you know, both sides are basically playing like six degrees of separation to absolute nuclear war or like genocide, right? And so it's like no matter mm -hmm. what they're debating, it ha they have to link it to like something just horribly, catastrophically awful. And it's always like nuclear war or like like, like an economic depression or, or genocide or like the world gets destroyed, like whatever, something like stupid. But um, yeah, yeah and, and I think that if there's not enough of a background in a subject and you come into it, then, then I think, yeah, you, you're going to have, um, you're going to be more susceptible, I think, to that kind of thing. Yeah, so you course, definitely need to, to have some context of like what you're really looking at. And th this needs to be like objective context too. So this, it needs to be like almost like a scientific context, very detached. So you, you get what this person's saying, why they might be saying it. What influence would that would they have? Like the effect has on people, so that they can know not to react and um, absorb it necessarily, at least not in that way. It's it's kind of like some people that are really very vulnerable. They are susceptible to reading, uh, let's say, the Bible or the Quran, and suddenly they're converted. They're they're radicalized, and now they need to. Uh, go on a crusade or they need to, you know, go, um, uh, what do you call it? What, what do you call it when the Muslims go kill for Allah? But, oh, um, yeah. Jihad? Jihad, oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was going to say the wrong word, too. Uh, yeah, the, they ne you need to know, hey, this stuff is really written from someone that isn't thinking objectively they're 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 projecting a lot and i think this guy stoltenberg is projecting a lot on on what he views uh the the male condition to be and that definitely clouds his judgment so yeah I anyone that um, by the time i got to part four i i'm like a thousand percent convinced that he um if he if he's not a rapist he like wants to be one and he's projecting that onto all men and i know that sounds like insane and like a like a ludicrously um like irresponsible kind of an accusation to make but like after getting through this entire thing i'm just like there's no other explanation <laughs> like, yeah he could what, actually be a rapist yeah. I mean, he, I, he might he even feel guilty really, for it too it, yeah it really feels that way like it really <laughs> but um like so, all sorry, comes racist style you know right no exactly it's it's occam's rapist but um <laughs> nice <laughs> so I, i'm doing some I'm a, I'm a bad host right now because i realized i haven't done a good job um introducing either of you we have fleegan who's regular on here regular guy on here and jadis um who you were on here back in january yeah yeah and that that one got a that stream got a little bit chaotic but that was a pretty interesting <laughs> yeah, with um, yeah, with, with uh, was it Jeremiah? I always forget his yeah. name. Yeah, yeah, Jeremiah. And <laughs> he he like he stirs up a lot of a lot of shit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, I thought I thought that you, you, might, you this was um a topic that you'd be kind of interested in. So it, it's definitely a topic I'm interested in, and it's it's one that I'm also very very concerned about. I I don't. I don't like all the changes I'm seeing in society that sort of, it, it weakens, it's, honestly, I feel like the image that they're putting forth of what a male is, or even should be, is very weak, and um, 
it's almost like they're trying to s sabotage things like those the the culture creators the curators of content the these um those in charge of the media those in charge of academia those that say this is what a man should be or this is what a man is i think it's very dangerous because one it alienates uh young males uh, and certainly makes them feel like they're 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 shit for being if they are normal um and then it also encourages them to adopt behaviors that are also quite weak so uh, there are like I've seen the example of what men should be, and okay, the, you're you're gonna maybe hate this, but the best example of what I I've encountered of what a man should be was actually sort of described indirectly from reading Theology of the Body. Are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar with that. No. Okay, it's written from Pope John Paul II. <laughs> Interesting. But yeah. Um, I really liked how they described, or how he described, um, basically sex and, and gender. And I, I got a, a very good impression of like, if this is what the Catholics think that men should be, well, then they'll be fine. And I've, I've seen my father's example of what a man should be. And maybe this is me being subjective. And, you know, when you're a child, like they say that your first love is, is your, your parent. Obviously, I wasn't born female, but still, like I love my, the example of my father, and any male that behaves like my father, I find to be attractive as a person, just as a person, as a decent human being. I think like that's that's a good person, someone that is confident, they're assertive, but they're compassionate. They have strength, but they have restraint, you know. And for some reason, in this society. You can't show strength because if you do, well, one, you know, men need to step down. They need to, you know, uh, step aside for women and crap like that. But also, supposedly, if they have strength, well, obviously they're go they're going to misuse that strength, and so they need to tone that down. And I I, I see that kind of stuff in in school where kids are full of energy and. Maybe they're roughhousing, and teachers treat them like they are, like there's something actually wrong with them psychologically. And so I've talked to parents, and they're like, "Oh yeah, so now my kid's on these drugs." Like, well, maybe maybe that's not right. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe and your if, kid... um, if they don't intervene, then they're accused of um, catering to the boys will be boys narrative. Yeah, well, that so, too. So there's even that set up to like move the the bar even further in that direction yeah um, but i i, guess, I think um, i didn't realize this earlier but um i schedule this th this is now at least where i am it's father's day i think for everybody else it's tomorrow yeah so this time i need is actually to perfect <laughs> yeah that, i i do need to call my father tomorrow though he's the only parent i actually care about <laughs> i yeah i love my father i hate my mother it's kind of weird Maybe that's why I'm trans. Who knows? No, see, and that—that's the other um, thing that's interesting about this, right? Is this series of essays it is called um, it's called "Refusing to Be a Man," and and now we have someone on here who literally refused to be a man. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And I, so I, I remember um, I listened back to I think it was I think it's I might be the very first video on your channel. Um, and it was it was something that you were responding to to someone who um, like they they were saying like oh you're you're not a real woman for whatever reason oh yeah yeah those are they, they had like a like a like a true scum kind of a perspective on it and you know you, you had a a point you were making about how like we're, we're all a work in progress and that um kind of kind of going against the definition i know that that video is a little bit it's a couple years it's old, a little bit so old and i've grown a lot since then too that was like one of my very very first youtube videos so it was like 2009 i think Oh yeah, so it was, 2008 that was or 2000. quite a while ago. That was <laughs> yeah, that was that was before I performed my own castration. I didn't know you. Wait, you performed that yourself? Yeah, oh, I are thought you, you like, knew that. No, are you like a surgeon? No, no, actually, I don't, I, 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 I work at, I work at a grocery that. store. What are you talking? About? <laughs> well, were you were you working like in like the deli, like the the butchering section? 
sorry. Actually, yeah, in the oh deli. I do work in the deli. That's a terrible joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, um, but I was determined enough to, to cut out my own testicles because my perception, of course, was that testosterone is a poison to me. I couldn't let that continue to, to poison my body. So the, the hormones I was taking and the, the, uh, the anti-androgens I was taking wasn't doing its job. And so I cut it out. I cut, I cut out the first one on one year and the next year I mostly removed this. Uh, it, you should, if you get a chance to check out some of the videos or, or you can read up on it, it's, I'm Googleable basically. Um, yeah, I actually have pictures if you're ever interested. I can show you what the testicle looks like on the outside of the body. That, might be a, that makes me a little bit squeamish, but... Um... Oh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Men are squeamish about that. But, yeah, but right. Do you keep them, like, in formaldehyde, or is it just, like... I wish I got to keep it, but they would not let me keep the, the, the testicle. They said that it was a biohazard. I was like, but but I want to keep it for my collection. Like I, I wanted to... Uh, Okay, I, that, that's that's a bullshit too. It's like you should be able to put that in like a jar or something. Right. I mean, yeah. I've I've encountered people that that have lost appendages that they got to keep, and for some reason this, the hospital wouldn't let me do it. So, yeah, I I was I would have considered a nice trophy. <laughs> that is, that's bullshit. But, I hear people even get to keep their tonsils, man. Like that's bullshit. Yeah. That's ironically like a pretty fucking ballsy and manly thing to do. Actually, I, I think of it as like one of the most feminine things to do. Um, it's like, I'm sure you've heard about women ha that have performed their own C-sections before. I have not if heard of this actually. Oh, Just like, I, I oh think yeah. I heard one story I... of like one surgeon who performed some experimental surgery on himself as like an experiment to like see how to do a certain thing or whatever. And otherwise, um, I didn't realize it was like a, the, this common of a phenomenon. I, oh yeah, there's quite a few things I've, like that. I had only heard about this doctor in Antarctica who had to remove his own appendix. Oh yeah, I've heard about that it's one too. The only thing I've ever heard about like this. Oh, well, I mean, I also look at it as like an abortion. <laughs> so as far as I was concerned, I was aborting my testicle and it's like a, a back alley with a coat hanger. <laughs> That's obviously I didn't use a coat hanger. I, I just, I use a scalpel and I use sutures, but that's kind of how I viewed it was as an abortion. And actually a dream I've had and I still have is that Planned Parenthood should do these kinds of procedures. Like Planned Parenthood or something like it needs to be there for trans people for like oophorectomies or orchiectomies or hysterectomies. They need to be there for us for things like that, I think. I mean, it is part of like reproductive health or at least, you know, anti reproductive health. So, yeah, I wouldn't count uh, on that from what I've heard about Planned Parenthood that. Uh... A lot of the stuff they say they stand for is only in name. Well, not, I don't know. They, they've done a lot of good. I'm not. There are things I don't like about Planned Parenthood, but there's a lot that I do like about them. And I mean, they will still see trans patients too. And I think that's that's a good thing. And they do real services for women, like birth control isn't even just about uh, reproductive health, or at least it's not just about preventing pregnancies. It's also regulating your hormones. And like some women even have like endometriosis. And so yeah, Planned Parenthood is actually, they, they do really good work. And while I don't necessarily agree with all the abortion stuff, because my, my feelings on abortion is like, it, it really shouldn't be like, even second tri trimester seems a bit late for me. And everybody pushing for the third trimester is like way, way past expiration. But, and, or, Planned Parenthood seems to be going along with that. That stuff I don't I don't like, but most of what the services they provide is actually good services for women, and, and, and I do fully support that. Yeah, and I think that's probably most people's uh, point of departure to Planned Parenthood is, um, you know, when people talk about, you know, a lot of these, these services that they provide, you know, most people say, oh, that's, that's well and good. They just don't like the fact that it's, um, that the whole abortion issue is, like, tied to that also. Yeah, but ultimately, being being libertarian, like my position is always going to be like, you shouldn't get an abortion unless you really, really need to, and like in most cases, 
I don't think that people do need to get. It's, it's basically stupidity. It's carelessness. But if you're, no matter what, no one has a right to tell you what to do with your body. It's your body, your choice. As, as long as there's like informed consent, you know what the risks are. Okay, that's fine. Now, I have a problem with people doing it underage. I don't think that under a certain age that you should be doing certain things. But then again, if you're underage, you shouldn't be carrying a child anyway. So in that case, it really should be like parents there with their kids helping them make that informed decision. But I, the parents probably should be helping their kids terminate the child. Mixed feelings, basically. <laughs> Mixed feelings. Yeah, anyway. It's one of those things where there's – it's kind of like you start off with a situation that's already – like kind of kind of bad so then there's yeah. kind of like no right answer like no matter what you point to it's always going to seem eh. I, i'm just waiting for the future when we have the artificial uteri because then we can abort every any baby all the time without killing the fetus and then it like it like completely sidesteps the entire ethical debate true um just take them out, you them also might find that you, you realize that in in that circumstance that the situation like china might actually be feasible where they just don't have females if they want to just have a single sex population they could get away with it with artificial uteri yeah, or they could maybe. go the other way and have have absolutely no men i mean i even watched, saw a really bad sci-fi in, in the 90s based on that <laughs> yeah I think yeah that, i saw that too was there's, it a out point, limits? Though, there's a point with these things where you try to skew toward toward one gender where i think eventually there'll be an, an equilibrium but um yeah because like in china a lot of it is there's so much economic pressure that you can put on to to males whereas like if you have a girl there's a good chance that it's gonna screw you over especially um when they had their one child policy enacted well which I think, th think about this so and if if you look at people not as people but as almost like machines or or it's just a human resource right between men and women who is more likely to ask for time off or have problems at work like physiologically and i think more likely it's going to be women part of it is women menstruate and women can get knocked up men can't so men have a bit more freedom it's, it's, it's one of the reasons why Men are more likely to to stay on a career path if they're working for a corporation, working at the ladder. They're more likely to stay on that path than women because men don't have to worry about having kids, right? So if you if you look at it, humans as just machines and you had artificial uteri, you might just eliminate the female sex altogether because you would get a more consistent labor output from them. Oh no, we wouldn't want that. <laughs> And then, <laughs> bearing in mind that men with testosterone uh, can uh, lift more, right? So larger structure, potentially more durable. Uh, and of course, because China has um, has CRISPR, they can genetically modify them to be whatever they want them to be for whatever purpose. So you could have like a brave new world situation there too. Very terrifying prospects. China has no ethics. I don't know. I'm really, I'm really optimistic about it. Um, this, this is the, this channel is pro China. We are pro China stream, um, <laughs> and we frequently, frequently, uh, definitely are joking about um, using transhumanist technology to basically genocide out all the women and have the the trapno state. So <laughs> nice. Maybe. <laughs> Fingers crossed. It's, it is still it is still funny to me that um, all of these crisp stuff. Um, um, on like on fertilized eggs or in the process of that, like everyone always goes to China because apparently most of the population of the world is not informed that Israel is doing this on a large scale. They're they're trying their best to kill the twenty four right. specific genetic diseases that have evolved in Judaism because of the inbreeding that comes with being the chosen people. Wait, what? Do you want to elaborate on that one for me? Well, the, f the first step they have now is they have a very specific um, pre-implantation, um, what you call it, predict, uh, like they, they analyze the genetic material of an in vitro, mm -hmm. already fertilized eggs, so they, they can kick out all the ones that have the specific diseases that have evolved, like SIPA. Yeah, so and, um, that's already and, like Gattaca right there. 
Yeah, they, they, they just, uh, in that, re in Gattaca, I, I don't remember, do they also modify or they just, just select so for the best? You you can, they modify them. They they can take out the bad genes, swap in some good genes and give them an enhancements. So, yeah, that, like, that's you, you can create designer right babies. Like, like, the it starts off with, let's eliminate these bad genes because we don't want our kids to have these genetic problems. And then it, it escalates up to, well, while you're doing that anyway, why not add this feature as well? Yeah, they, they aren't at that stage right now. They, they're currently just fertilizing a lot of eggs at the same time and kicking out all the ones that have the bad traits, like the genetic diseases. You know, but they're the working irony, on the next step. The irony can't be missed on anybody that they're essentially researching eugenics. Jews are researching eugen eugenics. A little bit <laughs> it's, weird. Yeah, it's kind of quite literally. All right. I'm all for eugenics as long as it's like libertarian eugenics, like like that are like peaceful. Like there's no NAP violation involved. Okay, so in practice, what does that mean? Um, well, that could just mean that I, I guess it'd be anti dysgenics, right? Because for example, you have like the welfare state, which is dysgenic, so you could get rid mm -hmm. of that, and then you could. I guess that's not really eugenics, right? But um, mm -hmm. I guess if people are like like making selections in terms of like who they want to mate with and saying, Oh, it seems like these will be a good genes or whatever. Like, I think that mm -hmm. that's like, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, we do sexually select all the time. I, yeah. I mean, that's, that's all of human history. We've selected for traits that we thought were more desirable. And sometimes they are, and sometimes they are maladaptive, but um, that that's not necessarily bad. Actually, um, we used to select for people that were stronger, had better eyesight, but then with modern technology, we don't need to do that anymore. So we sort of uh, let ourselves get weak. I know, and we're or, all weak and blind and allergic to peanut butter. It's awful. Well, the, so the peanut butter thing, that, that was covered in, in the, the cobbling of the American minds because uh, peanut allergies went up when people became more aware and more sensitive to those who have peanut allergies. So they try to be extra accommodating, which meant like, no, hey, since we have students that may be allergic to peanuts, you can't eat peanuts in this area. And so because fewer people were exposed to peanuts, that actually increased their allergy rate. And so it's small doses of that allergen over time that helps you develop an immunity to it. Your body realizes, hey, this protein isn't harmful. I can stop attacking myself. And but, but actually, because, I think the calling it allergen is kind of a misnomer because most of the population can just deal with this protein. Well, uh, yes, I think pretty much any and all the population could if they're exposed early enough in small doses over time. The issue is that we've been preventing that because we've been extra. Uh, cautious, worried about other people who might have an allergy. We, we took entirely the wrong approach. And that um, led to um, us being more fragile. And one of the things that, um, that, that was even brought up in the book because it, was, it sort of parallels our psych psychology being anti-fragile. We, we, we have the capacity to be, or the potential to be anti-fragile, but instead, because we coddle ourselves and say, hey, this is some things that we should be sensitive about, let's avoid it, then we become extra sensitive to it when we are exposed to it. I'm just going off on a tangent. I'm sorry. Carry on. No, that's good. I mean, that these streams are essentially defined by strings of tangents, so it's all awesome. It's all good stuff. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're in good company. But I guess, I guess maybe we should bring it back to the question of, um, I was sort of... Uh, sort of thinking out loud um, regarding this idea of like, 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 what is masculinity? Or do we even need the concept, right? Like, if we're, are, do we do what John Stoltenberg does and deconstruct masculine and feminine and then reject one? Or if we are going to have these terms masculinity and femininity, what's the best approach to defining them? Because I'm kind of taking this libertarian individualistic stance where I don't really have that much of a problem with people just doing away with it that doesn't necessarily bother me as you know <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily preclude anything 
Um, but but then of course we're kind of left with this amorphous situation, which is like, okay, well, what about people who want to find something to do, right? Or are we going to define it based upon, you know, how people are acting if they're, if, if they're, you know, if you have a male-bodied person doing this thing, does that then become the definition of masculinity, or, you know what I mean? Like so 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 there's like like an infinite different ways we could approach it. Yeah, um, I think that males and females have like average behaviors so like if you look at any given population of a, of a male and from any culture you'll find that males tend to behave a certain way like for example they tend to be more aggressive they tend to take more risks right they also tend to be physically stronger and what what we've done over time is we've we've decided well if it tends to be this way then it should be this way that should be the rule and then we start holding people to, to that standard. And over time, we start adding extra rules saying, okay, well, you should be this way, but let's, uh, let's be strong and confident because men tend to be that way. Um, but uh, give yourself some restraint, right? Because if you're, if, if you have, say, um, uh, confidence without restraint, then you're just arrogant, right? And if you're arrogant, then you're more likely to treat people unfairly. You're more likely to be insensitive to someone. So in, for the sake of fairness, uh, we, we put limits on those tendencies, those, the, the natural inclinations of, of male behavior. And you could say the same for some female behaviors as well. And I, I have no problem with that. I think that's fine. Uh, what I don't like is um, telling people that they're wrong for behaving naturally, right? And at least in a healthy way, saying, no, you should feel ashamed for that. So, uh, a guy looks at a girl and he gets turned on by her. He feels, you know, aroused. Well, that's a perfectly healthy response. But instead, people are like, no, 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 you're objectifying her. Well, maybe they're not really, but they are naturally attracted to her. So stop shaming them for that. There, there, there seems to be an awful lot of shame for just being whatever you are. If you're if you're naturally attracted to men, or you're naturally attracted to women, or you naturally behave a certain way, you naturally think a certain way, you shouldn't be shamed for that. It's it, the only time that anyone should try and intervene is when your behavior actually uh, prohibits egalitarianism, or and it hurts uh, a, a given group. Or, or whatever interest they might share. So you don't want to be the kind of person that the bulldozes, uh, like, let's say I'm dominating this conversation right now. I shouldn't be doing that. You should, you should tell me, Hey, Jadis, maybe you don't know what you're talking about. Let someone else talk. And I'd be like, yeah, that's fine. That's healthy. And I'm okay with that. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of that makes sense. Um, it kind of reminds me of like Aristotle, right? Has like a golden mean to everything. And I kind of like this approach where, you know, you, you have like a, like an average behavior, right, of males and females, which helps us have some kind of objective standard for figuring out like how is it that men and women tend to act. Um, mm -hmm. But then also we have room for saying, like, like I actually kind of like the concepts of the toxic masculine and toxic feminine, right? Of like, mm -hmm. like these are these are stereotypical like negative nap violating or even just just like just just like like gross or immoral behaviors that men tend to do and then some that women tend to do and i like this idea that i can prescribe to any man or woman like you're engaging in a toxic masculine behavior or you're engaging in a toxic feminine behavior and well, I guess why not just say you're being obnoxious you yeah, know because right. that, that's uh, what it really is well because there, there's like something the, the, where like 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 I don't know. Maybe it's kind of like a sex shaming thing where you tell a man, like, what you're doing is a toxic feminine thing, right? Or it has, like, an extra sting to it. I don't know. But the thing yeah. is, it's kind of hard to judge from my generation's point of view because I know a bunch of guys who fell victim to this, I would call it an attempt at social engineering based on the ideas of their parents where they're so respectful and so full of restraint towards women that they literally, even though they aren't ugly or unsuccessful or unattractive in any way, they have trouble attracting women because they're seen as weak. 
And yeah, and that's some of the things I've I've been talking about. Yeah, I th I think that is what we are doing in society right now. Is we are, we are, we are sort of encouraging men to be weak, and I think that like, it doesn't matter men or women, confidence is attractive, and if a man isn't confident, then he's not going to if he's if he's heterosexual, he's not going to really attract a female mate, or at least not a long term mate anyway. But it's it's gotten even to the point where uh, one friend of mine, he is very confident. He's just very timid in his interactions with women because he was raised to what he considers respect for women. They see as weakness. Like I, mm. I, I myself have been accused by a Spanish woman of being a homosexual for not grabbing her ass in the first 15 minutes of an interaction of flirting with her. She was like, why, why, are, why are you keeping a distance? Why aren't you touching me? Like, because in my culture, I was raised to consider this inappropriate, and I think your culture is yeah. a bit on the other end well, of the you spectrum, know what? where we you actually do have... inappropriate things. Okay, well, yes and no, it depends. Um, like, if you're from the South, depending on where from the South you are, let's say, if you're from the South and you're middle class, there, and you're not new money, then chances are you are raised, if you're a male, to be a gentleman, and then you don't do that. You you don't touch women like that, and that kind of thing really should be discouraged. And it's actually very um, it's it's unfortunate that that behavior we used to promote that gentleman like behavior for a long time. Now a lot of people say, well, that's sexist and all that, but uh, we used to promote being you know gallant and and chivalrous among males, and that means you don't touch someone inappropriately. The idea that a, a man might grab a woman by the pussy, that wasn't really, I mean, it happened, but it was never encouraged for a very long time. And, and our culture did radically change. Part of it was from, you know, the sexual revolution in the 60s. But a lot of it is pop culture kept ramping things up. And you can you can look to our music. You can look to our our. TV shows, and you can see how it escalated. And th this, is, certainly from where I'm from, this is, even when it was on TV, we'd be like, okay, yeah, that's gross. You shouldn't be watching that. Um, I think that the part of our, like, American society that still remains that way does tend to be Christian because they do sort of isolate themselves from the rest of the, the world. They look at that as well. That's secular behavior. That's not. That's not our way. And for that part, I like that and I admire that. What comes along with that? All the other religious crap I have a problem with, but that's a different matter altogether. Yeah, I guess it's hard to say anything about Christians as a group, right? Because half of them are basically socialists, and then the other half of them are conservative oh, okay. and socialists. I think it's working now. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I was trying to get it to fucking work. I couldn't hear you guys for, like, the first two times I joined. Mm. <sighs> that was weird. Anyway, sorry for interrupting. Well, no, well, like, so, hello, so I'm, I'm trying to... I'm not sure what to make, how to make sense of this. So, so I know that some Christians, right, particularly if they're, I guess take their religion more seriously, they end up kind of more on the conservative end of the spectrum, not necessarily even right-wing economically, um, but the, the, they'll define other behaviors culturally as, like, secular. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I, see, the, 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 I guess the issue I take with it is that um, there, there's a lot of good reasons for promoting like traditionalism, right? There's a lot of merit to it that you can point mm -hmm. to. And the problem is that when they peg it to religion, they're kind of like giving bad reasons for things that could be good. And then you look at that and you're like, well, these reasons are stupid. I'm going to, and then we throw the baby out with the bathwater. I agree. I, I see was, that a lot. Yeah, that was like the journey I had with, with Christianity where I kind of took it seriously for a while. And then I realized like, wait a minute, like this, this doesn't make any sense. This is really stupid. And then I kind of threw the entire thing out and then it wasn't until many years later that I'm looking at it and realizing, okay, like, like, like just because it's fundamentally a bunch of bullshit, like, th th it still prevailed and was successful for certain reasons, and you can kind of 
um, I guess to kind of cherry pick out of it what works. Some yeah. people think that's impossible. You can't really do that, but I'm I'm optimistic. No, I, th I think that there's there's good in all religions. There's good in most most um, ideologies. There's always a grain of truth in something. Like I, for example, critical race theory, I think is bullshit. But there's a grain of truth in it that I absolutely agree with. Um, a lot a lot of the crap the 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 far left embraces has grains of truth, and I still support. Like I, I still support Black Lives Matter. I, do I support the movement? Not at all. Yeah, no. Because, for example, the idea that like your experience and especially like, your immutable characteristics that like it's going to influence your perspective and your understanding of the world and your epistemology, like how you view things, right? And, mm -hmm. that, and that therefore it does make sense to have people who have those experiences to, to voice some of that. Like, mm -hmm. like they're. It does kind of undeniable, right? Yeah. It's just once it gets applied in this way, where you know we start to see those, I guess, as more important than they really need to be, um, and we're like we're ignoring the fact that fundamentally we're individual people, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, like, like you know, like Thomas Sowell, right? Kind of fucks up the whole BLM narrative. <laughs> Thomas Sowell and a yeah, thousand black true. dentists, right? Like. Yeah. Okay, but th there's, there's also this uh, weird issue that came up when um, I'm an, I'm I'm kind of a nerd. I like comic books, and there's like this movement where if you want to write a black character, you have to be a black person. And ideally, if you're writing a black lesbian, you should be a black lesbian woman. And and I'm not yeah. down with that because I think people have empathy. People have an understanding of other people's lives. Not uh, not everyone. Not everyone has the same capacity to uh, to just be around people and be able to uh, create characters that ha that are true to that characteristic of that individual. But it's literally a well, hundred it's, it's... years of fiction that proves that yeah, great like... white males can write black lesbians or shit like I've, that I've, what, this spiel that you're doing i think i heard that on on eric weinstein's podcast and and i agree with that um oh, anyone that, that has ever to them lately too i actually they're, they're kind of like npr but like tolerable they have that yeah. style of speaking right <laughs> they just nailed it i don't know why sorry <laughs> but, um yeah anyone that's ever cried to uh, uh, watching a film about a person of color, it, it, chances are it was written by someone who wasn't a person of color, and that that should tell you something. It means that they they, they definitely are sensitive to people who have very different experiences from themselves. So yeah, we're definitely capable of of empathizing and 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 telling a story that people would uh, agree with and and you know. Feel like, hey, I share that kind of humanity too. I I think it is absolutely absurd saying, oh well, this is my experience. You couldn't possibly understand where I'm coming from. We're all humans. We've all been through a lot of stuff together. Yeah, obviously there's a degree of severity, but most of us have had similar experiences, or have seen those uh, those experiences somewhere else, and we're capable of understanding that. So. Yeah, I think honestly, when they they play that, they're really playing the victim card, and that's to me that's a huge turnoff. That's actually, um, I think that's one of the the main criticisms of a lot of movies that are focused on the black experience is that it's this like big, really, really crazy like victim porn kind of a mentality of all of it, right? And I've heard a lot of people in SJW circles who like. Like they'll 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 complain about like how every single movie, um, like, like featuring of like a black story or black character, it's always like some some major tragedy, right? So it it is kind of funny because like, it that 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 speaks well, to this uh, idea that like there's there's almost like an abundance of the empathy, like too much. <laughs> what what about the film like like the 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 film uh, the pursuit of happiness? See that that wasn't really a tragedy. That was it's. It's a story of someone that, you know, they're, they're, it's as low as you can go. You're homeless and you're raising a kid and you're just trying to get by and you, you work your way up. And m maybe some people will say, well, this is just, you know, 
right-wing propaganda about pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, but you watch that film and you think, yeah, I've been through that, or I know someone's been through that. Like my own family, for example, they're white, obviously. They've been homeless. They've, they've lived in Section 8 housing. Actually, some of them still do. So it's something that they can definitely understand. And when you watch that film, you actually feel happy for them because you know, like, those are really hard times. Like, these, these, these are real, realistic situations. Like, that, this could be me, you know? So Yeah, and I've actually never but, seen that one. But I guess I wonder, ooh. um, yeah, maybe, maybe I should. Well, I don't, I only watch shitty movies. No. <laughs> I only like, I only like, like, really bad horror movies. And yeah, like, like the one with the clown. <laughs> Terrifier. Oh, seen, there are some. Oh, ter- that that's an that's the best movie. That's ever a good made. one. That's one thousand percent the best movie ever made. Is Terrifier. <laughs> it's about a. I like the part where he like stalks her with the wig and just like. Oh, that's or not so the wig. The, no, he, so he, he, he scalps her. I'm sorry. Of the lamb kind of thing. Yeah, wearing the homeless yeah. woman's scalp and and yeah. And nice. It's it's, <laughs> so, no, anyway, I want to get back to sort of your back to your point about yeah. um the, the the problem with like someone of, of being a minority status like so, some of the stuff i've heard i've heard some of their criticisms not about people of color but about like of jews you know if you're going to make a film about uh it's probably about the holocaust you know it's about uh the jewish oppression they've experienced like it's almost like an easy win like hey I'm, we're going to win the academy awards what are you going to do another holocaust film and it's it's almost like a running joke but like I think that people just assume that the only way you're going to get someone's attention if they're minority or if you're trying to tell a minority story is if it's like the saddest story you could come across. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, It can be sad, but it can also be happy. It can be inspiring and like pursuit of happiness was inspiring. I think there, there are some films like that. Maybe there aren't enough of them, but um, those are the ones we should be encouraging. I think is is the ones that make you feel good afterwards. So. And I guess that is a good point, right? That even though it's not necessarily a tragedy, that it still has an appeal on an empathetic level, right? Because like you, you want it, yeah. you're, you're even though you're seeing good things, that still represents the empathy. I guess as far as like whether or not these SJWs complaining about there being too much abundance of like tragedy in the films, I guess we'd have to go through and see like is it, you know, are we getting like three preciouses and. Um, what was it then, like midnight whatever or was it just called midnight i don't know all the like those are the ones i'm thinking of that immediately come to mind and i wonder mm-hmm. like what the proportion of those relative to pursuit of happiness is and honestly i have no idea because you know like i said i, I only watch shitty movies i watch scream you know, like every day <laughs> greatest movie but, ever <laughs> but actually i, I would I wouldn't es- essentially attribute like what i would call the death of the happy ending I've, I've, I don't. I don't think you can attribute that solely to SJWs because I've talked to people who went to film school, and they're being taught that a closed end or a happy end is a cliche that is so yesterday. That if you get a chance to make a movie, don't do a happy ending. Like the, the, personally, the ending better needs sweet be tragic. are my you know what I want to see actually okay. is a movie um, that's about like a modern day Jew being persecuted by the alt right as like a serious drama. Just because I, I think Ooh. it'd be really funny. I don't know. But yeah, just oh, to finish my point, I, I think the decline of certain tropes is based on the fact that most filmmakers these days actually studied filmmaking, whereas in the 90s nobody had. And before that, nobody had like Sandy Kubrick oh. studied photography. That's yeah. all there was to it. He t- they were all self-taught, and nobody told them actually. Uh, if the movie ends in this kind of fashion, or if you have this thing in it, that's bad because it's been done before. Nothing is bad just because it's been done before. Like why? Why aren't there more uplifting stories where? Why can't a movie about struggle and? Um, downtrodden life end with a person actually succeeding at the thing that they've been struggling for. Life yeah, struggling like, like Rocky, thing. right? Wait. I think it needs to, like, I think it needs to feel, feel earned. I think that's the issue, you know? Right, like, and and that's that's good. 
actually that that's actually very healthy because you you teach someone an important lesson that things aren't just given right so i think that's absolutely great and those are some of the the better films that we we watch uh i don't think that's a lot of the films that are coming out though is that we don't really seem to earn any of like even the ones that do sort of have a happy ending like all the disney schlock you don't really feel like they actually earned something i don't think Right, like I think I remember he- seeing a video about you know how you know back in Infinity War, like when Thanos won, and like mm-hmm. everyone thought like every everyone started like empathizing with him and thought he was like a great villain. That's yeah. because he actually earned his his victory. Then, like he actually sacrificed a lot. You know, he had to sacrifice Gamora. He showed like he actually cared for her, but he still sacrificed. He had to go through all this shit just to accomplish his goal. Of and then once we get to the ending where he finally sits down in peace, you know he's. It, it, we we empathize with him because he thought at least maybe not empathize but we understand him and think he's a great character because his victory was you know a, uh, earned he sacrificed the most so I think like when it comes to like making happy endings either for like the villain or or you know protagonist or whatever or any really character I think it has to feel earned. And like we don't really see that, like you said, in a lot of movies nowadays. Yeah. So, sorry if I, I went out of tangent there. The most offensive there. thing I ever said to Prince of Queens, from his perspective, was that I hated Infinity War and thought it. Was really <gasps> oh, I hate you too. too. I, hate you now. <laughs> I hate you too now because Infinity War was based in Red Pill and fucking um, what was it? The fucking gay movie after it. What was it? Endgame. Endgame, Endgame was terrible. I hated yeah. it. Yeah. They completely Endgame. rewrote his character into like. This like oh. guy who just thought he, what he was doing, like he was a very human character in Infinity War. He was obviously insane, but like he thought what he was doing was right. And to the to this guy who was just like a fucking bloodthirsty maniac. Yeah, was the best villain. The, the fucking, best villains absolutely what they're doing. Yeah, but the fucking cop up with Ant Game was saying, "Oh, it was Thanos from like four years ago." Like he can travel. That's a, that's still like no excuse. Like it's, it's like like why? So the fact that he sacrificed Gamora made uh, it ch- certainly changed the person. But Jesus fucking Christ! That even before the sacrifice, the motives, the logic was so different. It's a right. terrible cop out. Now he was a human thing. character back then, and now he is just some fucking edgy asshole who just wants to kill everyone now. Okay, so I know that um, we we shat on Disney a little bit, but one thing that we do have to um, note here is that um, they did give us the the one moment in any movie that best defines masculinity, which was Be a Man in Mulan. That song, I think, just wraps it all up. I think. Oh, yeah, that problematic song that they probably couldn't get away with anymore. Did, oh, yeah, did they add that to the new, the well, new they, film? I think they explicitly took that one out. That one's not featured, yeah. and that that character is also um, no, no longer in it. Because I think that it, it's too. It was a love interest, right? So they they didn't want him to be a love interest anymore, or maybe yeah. they didn't want it. They maybe they pull it a character because if they have his character, that means a man's teaching a woman, and how dare a man teach a woman? A I woman already knows. Want to offend China? Because then, like, you have Mulan in drag as a man, and then the other man is interested in him. Oh, my God. Even though it was, like, I don't know, like, like something convoluted like that. I'm not really sure. Did that, didn't that movie They'll still think out? it's a homosexual relationship or something? Was that movie <laughs> supposed to come out, or did, did it get canceled? The Mulan I thought, thing? St- I thought they were still working on it, or, or maybe it was on hiatus or something. But... Yeah, yeah likely I, I mean, I like Mulan, so I hope it comes out. But yeah, I, this, I know this that, remaking um, this remakes need to stop, man. I know it's if, awful. If, if they make it woke like they did with Aladdin, yeah, count me out. Yeah, the remakes oh, are bad, but like with Mulan, it's not like I'm that mad because Mulan was a great movie. So, but then if they, then again, if they fuck it up, that that means I, I actually made a mistake by supporting it, and I'm a retard. <laughs> because then if they make it, they're gonna ruin it. Okay, one. Okay, so so the movie that's the best is Treasure Planet, but that's the movie that basically um, ended all of those styles of movies because it was super expensive and then nobody wanted to see it, even though it was like fantastic. I thought yeah, it was also that happened, combined with yeah. I don't know if Disney actually fucking made but, like the ones the where they go underwater in this like weird submarine to Atlantis. Atlantis, yeah, Atlantis right? yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Atlantis. Yeah, I, I loved that as a kid. Like, holy shit. So, yeah, I, w- were they made by Disney? Atl- I think they were. Atlantis. I think, I think you're right. It might have yeah. been. I used to think so, that the Anastasia movie was made by Disney, and it turns out it's not. Wasn't that a Don Bluth movie? I don't remember. I, I don't, don't think Don so. Is. I think it means parody or something. Is that what it means? Now, Don Bluth was one of the greatest American animators of all time. Oh, like any, okay. Any great animation picture that you've seen that looks really nice that isn't Disney, it's almost, almost any of them is Don Bluth. Hmm. Okay. But that's that's re- that's the issue I have with this animation movie thing. I don't think the natural animation, like, drawn thing will come back because... It's been like 30 years since the last time they really trained people in animation. Well, it's to not be that kind cost of, uh, effective, is it? Like, the reason why they decided to go the way they have is because you save a lot of man hours doing it on the computer. That's a good point. Also, I mean, like, the CGA is, a, like, if CG done, is done right, it, it can actually be superior to um, 2D, in my opinion. Like, but the, it's, the, the, the issue thing is, is that they the already that... outsourced the animation in the 90s to Japan. In the 80s. I mean, Japan is already starting to use CG. Yeah, yeah. And, and, Japan and has the a problem. The Japanese not... outsourced to South Korea and Taiwan and what what have you. Like, we're gonna run out of cheap labor countries to actually do the brunt work of drawing cells, even if they use a computer. Is that the future? Is that instead Supply of us demand. getting um, instead of us getting our like Nikes from sub-Saharan Africa, it's going to be a bunch of like four-year-olds that are trained in making really awesome 2D animation for us, so we can finally have our old Disney movies back. <laughs> That's fun. I mean, like I guess it's supply and demand because like if people want, like if enough people want it back, they're gonna like train people to make make 2D again, right? So I, I, guess I, I, I got a question: is, is Venture Brothers done like the old the old way? What? Well, that's when brought, I, but the old way what do you mean by the old way like, like, like instead of using like don't, don't they do everything sort of by hand even on a computer or whatever I, f- I think th- they do it by hand yeah on I think that's one of the reasons why it takes so long to way. produce it it's like so like like only a handful of people actually animating it and they're the, yeah and the yeah, only so. person who still trains people in the art of that is hated by everyone John Crick for Lucy the guy who made Ren and Stimpy. Yeah. Oh, the guy. Oh, God. Ren and Stimpy was fucking terrible. <laughs> so he's a master of the arts. He he trains people for free on the internet because the academies, like uh, the universities, they don't actually teach people how to do 2D animation anymore. Aww. And, the best and he's probably anything. not going to live that much longer. Like, he's having a very unhealthy lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's artists for you. Artists are the best. No, the, the the best 2D animated anything is definitely Super Jail. I don't know that. I've never heard of that. Oh, it's so good. You gotta watch they Super love that Jail. One. Super Jail is so good. <laughs> what what is it? It it's so it it's a jail and um the warden is kind of like Willy Wonka. And, like, basically, they have all these inmates in this jail, and, like, all this, like, crazy surrealist shit happens. And it generally, it every episode just, like, devolves into, like, stream of consciousness, fantastical violence. Oh. It's, like, it's, like, it's, it's like absolutely like, weird. Um, and, like, it's, and, like, the is, actual is this something that, is interesting. Does this, is this something that comes in, like, Adult Swim or what? Yeah, yeah. It like sounds like swim. it. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like their, their cup of tea. Well, yeah, the the actual training, like I mean, Super Chail and the Ugly Americans, and all that stuff, it is actually quite well made. But you can't compare it to the late '80s, early '90s stuff, when they they the training of the people is just different. I, I respect the talent of the people, but I think they would have done an even better job if they had gotten like a Don Blue or John Crick for Lucy to train them. Like they literally used John Crick for Lucy on Nickelodeon to train all of their animators and then they fired him. Oh. Because they thought like, hey, we have we, we have his skill. We we extended into it into other people so we can just replace him. And then they fired a got a bunch of other people and made SpongeBob with all the trainees. 
which is still something I won't forgive them for. Like, you shouldn't have fired those creative people just because they cost money and the trainees were cheap. Yeah, yeah I think that's such a shitty thing when businesses have people train their replacements. I just think that it's like, like I don't... Yeah. <laughs> it's, just like it's an obviously bad move. You know, uh, this is a completely different topic, but I have this tendency to work at places where I'm training my bosses. And I'm always training my bosses, and I never get the job that my bosses get. I don't know why. It's like, wow, I know your job, but I'm teaching you. Anyway, carry on. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, that's a lot of the service industry. But anyway, anyway, that was a completely different tangent. So on this thing, so so basically these series of essays he's defining everything that's bad as that which is masculine and then rejecting it sometimes i wonder like like i've said um i often say women should should man up right Mm -hmm. um and then it makes me think you know what why don't we just define everything that is good in human ethics and morality as the masculine and then just encourage everyone to be more like men and I mean, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that we should just encourage everybody. Because men like are just I'm gonna, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with this and see see how long it takes to get torpedoed. So like, what I is mean, is it is not right? like the principle like, of feminism? Like, like the whole thing about feminism is like there is no feminine behavior. Like any feminine behavior that they encourage you to do, well, that's sort of sub subjugation. It they what they consider to be femininity is is weakness for women. It's like well. What if a woman wants to be strong? What if she wants to be confident? What if she wants to speak up for herself and instead of you know shy away? You know, what if she wants to uh, dress a certain way? You know, what if she wants to be more utilitarian instead of dainty? You know, like yeah, th- those are those are good things, and feminism encourages that. I think essentially what you're arguing for is feminism, but saying it's masculine. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's one of the things that I'm struggling to understand about this whole series of essays, right? Because, like, what he does right out the gate is he says, well, ideally, we shouldn't have this gender binary. Ideally, we shouldn't have the masculine and feminine. We should all be gender fluid, amorphous, alien creatures, whatever. Yeah. Um, and, but, but then, you know, if we go, I'm going to jump to, like, part four here where he does this, like, just gay, bitchy, sarcastic poetics about... Um, how <clears throat> how horribly oppressed women are, right? And how men need to man up and do more to protect all the women, right? Just, like, look mm-hmm. at all this stuff. And, like... So then he's backtracking. Well, it, it's kind of, like... Basically, it's like he has an ideal where we don't have this, but then he's saying, well, since we're in reality right now, men need to stop being men, essentially. They need to refuse to be men so that we can not have this top-down structural like patriarchy oppressing all the women so that women can finally stop being victims right mm-hmm. and it's like but then how, how are they going to protect women if men are not being men like well, I, I don't get that, that because that like once the men are no longer men then that you don't have to protect the women against anything because it ends all the problems like it ends war right because war is phallocentric <laughs> war is just a, a dick measuring contest with with nuclear missiles. That's all it is. But that's not it because like women would start all these wars if men weren't here. Like it's, Jesus, like, no, they like it's not like it's, no, they wouldn't. Yes, they, that's the, just, look, look, look like the only the... reason why women don't do it is because men are more competent at it. Obviously, at you haven't read from Stoltenberg. Soul. Okay, you're just ignorant. <laughs> like, God. because if only men are opting to be the leaders of the country, it's only men that can start the wars. Like, I have to explain this to fucking feminists all the time. <laughs> uh, I, here's what I would say. Here's what I'd say. In 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 a scenario where we get that ideal outcome where men aren't men anymore, right? Some other culture where men still are men is going to come in and dominate the shit out of us. That is what but would happen. They it's would actually kind of already happening. In, in no, you guys are countries. delusional. The bonobos are doing fine. They're thriving, obviously. Don't they rape each other? I thought bonobos raped each no, other. No, the bonobos, I think they up. have... I think they have consensual. I don't know if bonobo. Oh, they they don't, don't, that's no, a, yeah. No, so no, one no. of them's one of them's like super upset, and then another one's like, "Hey, hey, here, let me jerk you off." 
Yeah. Yeah. So they, they basically you're you're together. you're describing the bonobo and chimpanzee situation because like if chimpanzees yeah. ever get the ability to fucking like come over to the bonobo side, they're just gonna they conquer them. They do. Yeah. That's why bonobos they're yeah. like they're they're dumb and all they do is rub their dicks together and they're like endangered. And that's like the yeah, well, ideal. You know what? You know what, Derek? At least they still have their foreskins. At least they still have their fore that's true. They got that so. over the humans, you know. At least the Marimots, so <laughs> Are Marimont's yeah, human? I don't know. I don't, well, some, I don't, someday, someday the Americans will rise above and surpass the level of bonobos in basic human ethics. Fingers sure. crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> not this generation. Still, uh, not the next generation. Not the one after. <laughs> but in I want the right years, to be able to dock with my boyfriend, okay? <laughs> oh, yeah. And then in a hundred years, people are going to deny that it was ever a thing. They're going to be like, no, -uh, that was never a thing in America. That's all just that's an alt right conspiracy. It was never a thing. <laughs> I like, hope okay, not. I hope I'm going okay, to sure. I'm going to record it. I'm going to fucking record it. So people know. Honestly, no, no, no. I'm, no, willing but... to, I'm willing for that to be a thing if you end it. But but on the condition that we just pretend it was never a thing. I'd be like, OK, fine. We'll just we'll just go along with that lie. <laughs> Oh yeah, they like they like say, oh yeah, okay, we'll end it today, right? Like right now. We'll end it today, but you can't yeah. give us any crap for it, okay? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I'll take right. that deal. Could you imagine the still... Nazis were like, okay, we're gonna stop the whole death camp thing, but like you guys gotta promise not to give a shit about it for like a hundred years, okay? We're like, okay, fine, fine. Like just stop. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm still like flabbergasted that people still have this idea that there would be no wars if women were in charge. Like, if you look at the fi last 500 years in Europe, it was usually the queens that insisted that the king had to go to war. And in the First World War, one of the, I don't remember which king it was, said, if my grandmother was still alive, this war would have never happened because all of the major states, all of the kings were first cousins railing war against one another and then he's just said hey, if grandma was still alive she would have told us to shut up fuck up and get along with one another and it's just a weird thing okay <laughs> if you look at the history of wars in feudal europe it's it tends to be majority instigated by queens thing you can't let this person do that you have to do this so now we're gonna have war yeah, though so, you know maybe, like mm, like, basically the point I'm trying to make is that uh, women are just probably just as bad, if not worse, or um if you know men were all just like completely gone and there's only women there to like fight over resources and like fucking food like they wouldn't like like I I, I just love to like think about like what like these rad femmes like think about what happened like in a world with only women. Because like I, like, do you think they would just get along completely? There would be like no w world issues whatsoever. There would be no war over resources, no starvation. Like just fucking, you know, women would just all, all get along because women well, totally never yeah, fight. Yeah, I mean, we we saw exactly that. Things came out very well when Hillary Clinton handled things in Libya. Oh that, yeah, the, Libya oh, yeah. is a perfect example of how a woman should run foreign affairs. Oh, we certainly. Came, and had she had gone, saw, I think she was died. saying that, um, that, that she was like, a no-fly zone over Russia or whatever, and, like, like all this shit that, like, clearly would have led to some instigations there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just that women are just as bad as men. That's yeah, why I want yeah, feminists so, to yeah. admit. It's just that you women that, have less capability to do it right now. We, we essentially, under Clinton, we armed terrorists to take over the Libyan government. They eventually succeeded they also raped gaddafi and then they turned libya into yeah they ripped him with a knife i think yeah, yeah. and then the, then and the, now libya it. is where you go to sell slaves sex slaves sex trafficking there's a major hub for sex trafficking is libya that didn't really used to be a thing until hillary you know did her business in in libya so yeah that's Not to say that gaddafi was a good guy but uh... He wasn't a, you know. I think he was probably he probably wasn't an angel, but from what I've read, he's probably he wasn't probably a dictator like Hillary said he was. Honestly, you know? as far as like all the Middle East tyrants out there, he was actually one of the more progressive ones. 
I, I've read some of the, some of the things that he he proposed, and actually he highly encouraged women to engage in politics. And this is a Muslim guy, so yeah, the the uh, the religion and the culture that took over was very sexist, and that's like honestly they were the opposite of Gaddafi. And like I don't think he was a great guy, but I I'm not gonna say this. I wept for Libya when we started bombing Libya. Yeah, it was quite predictably so. Like people said, this would happen. Like they didn't predict the slave trade. Like they didn't and Hillary go doesn't that want to take it. And Hillary doesn't want to like take uh, responsibility for basically just making another hard patriarchy in the Middle East. Because yeah. <laughs> she killed the whole the whole. Like of course that it felt like, of course like all these fucking like barbaric like, fucking Muslims who have like, um you know, female genital mutilation rituals and just, like, like beat the shit out of their wives, like, would just, like, take take place, like, yeah. after, like, the power vacuum was, like, gone, because like, what what the fuck do you think it would happen? It's the Middle East. Yeah, it's like this. It's like the... I'm sure you've heard the argument that the germs in your mouth are actually some of the better germs, and if they were gone, some nastier ones would take their place. Sometimes you need germs. Sometimes, like, there are worse ones out there. You kill, like, let's say you kill 99.9% .9 of the germs out there, and that 0.1% is the nastiest motherfuckers out there. That's basically what we, we did when we, we bombed Libya, and we m paved the way for some of the, the nastier assholes in, on that continent. And, yes. yeah, we're, we created super germs out of these these people, so... I, yeah, and especially with Gaddafi, this guy you could negotiate with, and he yeah. would actually up, uphold his end of the deal. So that made him one of the lesser evils in that part of the world. I think I think that actually makes him incredibly important if you think about it, because he was the only guy we could talk to in the Middle East. Well, not just yeah. us, but also um, I I don't know if you heard about this, but um, like when when all this is going on, Gaddafi called Tony Blair. He was very very tight with Tony Blair and he was asking for help, begging for help and saying, I can only hold these guys back for so long. I need you to come and help me. And he just, Tony Blair didn't do shit. Didn't, he just let it happen because that was what was supposed to happen. <clears throat> Libya was supposed to fall. So it's actually very tragic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, 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 can... when I, go ahead. I, I, I was just going to be edgy and say, well, we can hope for Hillary gets her comeuppance one day, but I don't want, also don't want to get murdered by CIA agents, so. Too uh, late. Disappear. Too late. So. But yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, the only thing I was going to say is that I legitimately cried for Libya that, yeah. when that happened. Like, I was, I was working at Waffle House at the time, and I had to stop what I was doing and sit down and cry. That's actually a thing I did. Well, maybe <laughs> Billy and Hilly, Billy and Hilly will get there someday. Yeah. We can hope. Hillary Clinton might become president this year. Isn't that kind of a crazy <laughs> fucked up thing to Wait, think about? Wait, what? You know what? I'm actually hoping that, uh, what was it? Who's the one that Admiral mixed something and Andrew Yang were sort of, did did, did you see uh, the, the Joe Rogan podcast with Brett Weinstein? No, I didn't. Uh, this was oh, earlier you this should, year, yeah, but it? basically. This, this, no, this is like a few days ago. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very recent. And so, so he basically is like, Brett Weinstein is, is saying, okay, we've got problems with our politics, and here's how we fix it. We take someone who is center left and someone who's center right. You have one is the VP, one is the president, and then they switch places in, in four years. And and they keep doing that over and over until one has served to, two terms. And Ew, I think that's I a great, that. great idea. I hate it. <laughs> no, I think it's a great idea. Actually, it's not all that different from, from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't the VP used to be the one that lost in for, in our presidential race? So like, Maybe. like if if a, yeah, I think that's how it used to be, and that actually seems more balanced to me. Um, instead, it's what we have is we 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 vote for someone, and that person that we vote for, whoever gets nominated as Democrat or Republican, they pick someone that no one would vote for. So that if, God forbid, they should get assassinated, um, that asshole takes over. So no one would want to, let, let's say, for example, Joe Biden. No one would want Biden to be president. That's why Barack Obama chose him. That was his bulletproof vest. Because 
Biden is an idiot. So did he pick someone that he felt safe with? Same thing with Trump. Trump picked Pence because Pence is a Bible-thumping asshole. No one, no Democrat would want to take out Trump, no serious Democrat anyway, unless they're really radicalized and actually not thinking. No one would take out Trump because then we'd get Pence. And Pence. So, so, so basically 90% of the liberal party right now. Well, yeah, I would well, say that, yeah, Trump was probably <laughs> the first might... president where people would seriously consider that just because TDS is real. Um, yeah, I but don't, Pence, I don't know if that's actually anyone real. who knows who Pence is and what he's done. He's not a guy you want to be as president. So I don't think they that care. was why he picked him. I don't think they care at this moment. I think there's, they're just so like retardedly fixated on like getting Trump out of office. They don't. They they want to even. They do want him out of office, but I don't think they're thinking of the next step in line. Yeah, but, that's yeah. yeah. But that is that is why he picked Pence. And my thinking was that if if uh, Hillary Clinton uh, got nominated. Uh, for the uh, party, she would have picked uh, Bernie Sanders. I thought she would have picked him because the Republicans would certainly never take out Hillary Clinton if 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 Sanders was was her VP because they wouldn't want Sanders to be president, right? Instead, she picked some other asshole who was it, Tim Kaine, and that didn't work out so well. Um, but never mind the fact that we were voting be- between. The monster we know versus the monster we don't. The one that hides in the shadows, which is Hillary Clinton. And we felt safer, apparently, with the monster that we did know because he laid everything out on the table. People, people confused his, uh, his candor, Trump's candor, with honesty. That's why they voted for him. Or at least that's part, part of why they voted for him. And yeah, also well, because um, they, wanted, they wanted to spite Hillary Clinton for screwing over the DNC. I, I wish that Trump had kept the same demeanor as he had on the campaign trail, right? Because Trump, the candidate, was very different from Trump, the, the actual president. Oh, he, you're he right. He became too yeah. presidential. It just it pisses me off. I wish he had just kept being like... <laughs> just, just, well, just like the good, same. News is, good news is it's campaign season. And he gets to play that that character all over again. The downside is it's in the middle of a COVID season, COVID-19. So maybe we won't get to actually see that. Like we, today, I think he's a rally. But I'm also expecting that, like, for one, we heard everybody complaining. Many want to protest. How dare he even hold a rally in the middle of COVID-19? Never mind the fact that we've got these massive protests that the media is encouraging. But he supposedly, you know, he's got these rallies and, well, that's just another KKK rally, right? And so they're going to do everything they can to discourage those rallies and discourage people from participating. And so they'll shame them, do whatever they can to prevent them from going, even fear monger, like, like make them think that if they do go, maybe they're going to get sick because of people that will be placed there deliberately to make them sick. So I don't know if you, if you saw this fake ad on Craigslist that's been going around online, people saying that, uh, or asking for people who have COVID-19 to basically attend. And I think, honestly, that is, they weren't legit. I don't think they were actually soliciting people who are sick to partake in biological warfare. The whole point of that was to sort of psych out people who are conservative so they might not go because they're afraid that they're going to get sick from people that will do that to them, so... Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, and we're already seeing the hypocrisy in like newsline articles, right? Where like with all these um, quote unquote protests slash riots happening, you know, ma- magically they're they're saying, oh, there's a there's a safe and responsible way to to do this, and then, you know, as soon as it's a Trump rally or whatever, now all of a sudden they're a bunch of COVID idiots. Yeah. 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 It's always double standard like that, but I mean, we might get to see a fun Trump campaigning and he, every time he does that he comes off like a stand-up comedian well, hell even his tweets are like a comedian these days but for me it's just a reality tv show frankly yeah. like i'm not actually i mean he is he is a, he's a reality <laughs> tv actor that he, he never i mean he never let go of that spotlight that's why he's always on twitter he's doing this because he wants to keep the media's attention it's like look at my face don't look at my hands so maybe he's busy doing something else he looks like an idiot on camera, and we're supposed to pay attention to his blunders and the stupid shit he says. But what's he actually doing? That's what we should be paying attention to. I think a good thing that um, I think it was Turtle Monkey that uh, that he pointed out about COVID 
was that he thinks that what the ba what basically the media was doing was that um, they were using it to put pressure on Trump so that if people if, if people started dying from COVID, they could just say, OK, it's Trump's fault, even though it wasn't even his fault for it entering the country. That was actually who, you know, World Health Organization's fault. So he basically was put into this like, you know, um, situation where either he, he had to uh, say pe say to people, hey, calm down. It's not that big of a problem. Just social distance or lock down the fucking country because he doesn't want um, the deaths being blamed on on him, you know? Yeah, he can't because win, no matter what he does. So basically, he had to lock him down. So, yeah. yeah. yeah well, it, I'm actually I'm glad you brought up TFM because the other point he made that was really interesting was that, um, you know, voting for Republicans didn't really get people anything that they wanted. And the entire reason that we're seeing all of these riots and the entire reason that, like, basically... It seems like local governments um, have, have used this uh, COVID as an excuse to, to nuke the economy because they want the economy fucked and they want social unrest. So h had you let the Democrats win, this wouldn't have happened. And if the Republicans aren't going to actually deliver on any of their promises, you might as well just say let the Democrats have the whole government. And it's, 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 I, the way he put it, I think, is, um, I, I think, yeah, I think it's a probably the the best packaged of the kind of not not even necessarily accelerationist arguments but just you know it's a good it's pretty point. fucking scary because that's gonna accelerate the right like any like sort of like radical right wingers like by 10 you know what i mean well i just think it's all gonna collapse so if it's a game of hot potato i want the democrats holding the potato <laughs> because then they can hold because then we can point to them like when whatever the fu whatever it, the fuck happens, yeah. civil war. If it does, they'll just whatever. do what. If it does, all they'll do is say, "Well, it's Trump's fault. We inherited this. That's what they always do. Everybody yeah. always blames the past regime. They'll never take any responsibility for themselves. And of course, anything that does go right, they're going to take full credit for. So, what if do you it, think well, a collapse it, this scenario when it comes to the US what it would look like? Would it be like a sort of like fucking I don't know civil war or like a freaking just like depression, I think or just like Mad depression. Max, Great Depression. I mean, the the Civil War thing could sort of pan out if tensions get high enough, and part of it is a prolonged, forced unemployment, and this has been my concern for a long time. And actually, one of the things I've argued before is that some of the some of the looting that we might be seeing might be because people are just not allowed to go back to work. If you can't go back to work, you can't provide for your family, maybe you're not getting enough state assistance or any assistance, then maybe there's more incentive to break the law and steal just to get by. So, like, I, I will never condone looting, any of, any of, any of this rioting and looting and destroying uh, property. I will never condone any of it, but I understand it. I understand how some might actually think that that's okay, or at least... They might make concessions as to why they can justify that kind of behaviors. Because, yeah, they've been locked up, uh, pre prevented from making an income, or they have a very limited income. Uh, they're being told by the authorities that they have to behave a certain way, but then they also see from authorities that they've got a different set of standards. Like you see a governor saying, oh, you, you have to, every, the whole state needs to be on lockdown, but then they still attend events where they clearly aren't locked down, right? Yeah, it's like you almost see, like it was planned. It but does like, almost seem like this is is deliberately trying to agitate people. Like they yeah. really want people to start rebelling. The question is, if that actually is the case, why would they do it? I yeah. what I think is where where you see people like like governors, you see their hypocrisy exposed. The question is, how do people know to expose that hypocrisy? That's that's what you should be looking at. Is look at who's shining the light. Normally, I wouldn't say that when it comes to whistleblowers because, of course, we want, you should be encouraging whistleblowers. But I do know that the media is absolutely it seems to be hell bent on a revolution, one way or the other. And in in one direction, they might go is is a Mar Marxist revolution. The other might be helter skelter, which terrifies the shit out of me. Yeah, I think what's probably going to happen is it's probably going to be like 
given how many guns are in the U.S., I'm actually kind of scared that there might be like a civil war or like something crazy like that. Well, if there I mean, is, that might, that might be a little have, bit unrealistic. I but, am armed, so God forbid, I I, I should be able. But to like, if myself. you think, if you think, I, I think that there is going to be a civil war, honestly, because like, look at how many fucking guns are in America, and like when when shit like hits the fan and like the economy collapses, what do you think people are gonna go to? Well, it's gonna take oh. a little more than that. Like, it just the other day I saw a story about someone, uh, father and son business owner in Chaz someone broke into their business and set a fire and they detained him and called the police and there was no response and even though the police and the fire department didn't come to aid and even though they were armed they didn't just shoot the fucking asshole who decided to break in and set a fire so uh, we might be underestimating the common sense of these people like if, if it keeps going for long enough yeah civil well, war I think there's gonna, it's gonna be like but a... uh, not that soon not that easily I mean yeah but I, I think there's got what, what's probably going to happen is like there's gotta be like a sort of like tribal split in a way um I think because people will like like form groups based based on probably race or at the very least like um like culture um because basically if someone says like hey i can fix this shit they're probably going to rally under them and they're in a sense people have guns and you know there might be a like group violence there maybe not as big as a civil war but there's at least going to be an economic collapse like great depression style with like like um skirmishes you know what i mean mm-hmm I think that over time, though, virtually everyone across the board, they're going to look back and think, you know what? Things post-2020 are so much worse than they were pre-2020. And, like, every single person is going to have just a basic motivation to kind of cut out the bullshit. Like, like, I think think we're kind of overestimating people's willpower. Well, I mean... They'd have to be objective, and that means that they need an opportunity to to take the time to step back. If you keep them inundated, over, like overwhelmed with nonstop politics, one, yeah, you will get some fatigue there. But if you're constantly um, occupying them, we say even just trying to survive, they may not have time to reflect. I think, and that's one of my concerns is that this economic situation. Is doing that. It is it's sort of forcing people to think about the here and now more than anything else. How am I just going to get through the day? And I'm, I'm worried that with, with this COVID, um, I don't know if it's going to end. I'm worried it's going to be like the war on terror. It might never end. We'll, we'll have our cycles of... You think people are that stupid, though? It's not necessarily stupid. It's more like they're subjected to it and they're incapable of escaping it. So if if you're constantly being forced by authorities to behave a certain way, playing Simon Says, go to work, don't go to work, you can wear masks, so no, you can't now. You know, I think that uh, you know, maybe you can put food on the table. Maybe you can buy these things. Uh, maybe Now you can't. Um, I think that so, rationing, food rationing, is going to be a, a real thing pretty soon, too. Um, so it's like a... It's a way to implement a police state, is what you're saying. I think that we are being conditioned to sort of something of a police state and, and listening to authority figures. And I think that some of that conditioning is actually um, deceptively subversive so that we will actually stop listening to authority, start rebelling, and eventually de- destabilize as a country, which would open us up to forming a new country or or joining some other country. And like my biggest concern about this has been that this is ultimately about, believe it or not, globalism. And one of the reasons why I believe this is because of the Marxist agenda, which is uh, following the, these uh, movements, especially Black Lives Matter is apparently declared itself Marxist. And uh, the, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I think it is ultimately about globalism and I think that we are being destabilized like we've destabilized countries in the Middle East with our CIA 
I do hope there's going to be a breaking point because a lot of people mentioned that all of the meshes that were put in place after the incident in New York, as I am inclined to call it, the airport security, the terrorist watch all over the world, like nobody expected this to be going on 19 years later. Like we just accept it as an as a reality that this is now how we live. And that wasn't that invasive, like it was for international travel, obviously, and the rights that the uh, inf information agencies like the CIA and FBI got across the world, like n none of that's been rolled back. It's just getting more invasive. So I do hope so people have a breaking you're point the where they. Or what? Yeah, uh, this has been pretty stable at this level of okay this we can we can push this on people so now it's it's becoming very rapid so i hope people have a breaking point where they just say we're not gonna do that we're not gonna well, accept this and i don't maybe, i hope it's not gonna end in violence but it has to end uh, well helps. i think my only issue with your little theory um is that like if the, the u.s collapses and they like try to make a state or like a new country based on that, like that's a very vulnerable time to get co-opted by another group who has different intentions. So and I don't especially know. Especially because would... in America, like Americans worship Abraham Lincoln, right? So like, like imagine if Trump yeah. as president, he'll be like, ooh, someone just seceded. Now I get to be Lincoln and get to have another civil war. And it's just like, uh, I don't think because like, if you think you're all right, let them you think you're all right. God damn it. Because if you think the alt right is going to let that happen, if they do, if the country does fucking happen, like I have another word. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry, a bunch, of, bunch, a bunch of douchebags with tiki, tiki torches uh, with but, guns. May, maybe some of them have guns. May, maybe all. No, of them they almost guns. all have. But but they're still small in number. The alt right isn't that big. You, you have more real conservatives, a lot more real conservatives than you have alt right, and. I'm less worried about the alt right than I am of the far left, the far and they okay, are I guess a much fair. larger number. Mm -hmm. I guess that's fair, but just look how they gather a crowd. Like Charlottesville and events in Germany that was were kind of similar. They were announced, and people came from quite far a distance to even get this little amount of people together. But with the with the riots in the last few weeks. It just took a bunch of uh, basement dwelling of Antifa's coming out of the suburbs to create this chaos in the bigger mm -hmm. cities. So I think the far left is far more, far bigger than the far right. They're bigger and more dangerous, and they have the media on their side. They've got the they media. The media. They've, got, they've got the media and the the essentially the culture creators on their sides, which that gives them a huge edge. So. I agree, but then you might also have to take into consideration that if the country does collapse, that might radicalize a lot more of the right, to the point where like, okay, maybe maybe it's not as big of a difference numbers wise now, because that's I what mean, happened in Germany, right? It's like when the economy co was collapsing and Marx basically were like worth nothing. That's when Hitler took power. So, so what what were the lessons from that though? So that we, we, fascism we know, is bad. Or, well, <laughs> but what what I'm seeing actually is sort of something similar to what happened during that time, but instead of it being the fascists that are scapegoating, you know, like you know Hitler's like, well, it's obviously the Jews' fault, so it's the French fault. Um, instead of uh, the fascists that are doing that, we've got the the Marxists that are doing that, or uh, the Marxists and most importantly the intersectionalists, the the critical race theorists that are blaming cis white hetero men, you know, and you've got celebrities, you've got singers, you've got major influencers, you've got uh, people on CNN, trusted news organizations that even centrists will listen to and take seriously. You got them saying, oh yeah, they're right. You should check your privilege. You need to listen to them. You've got Sesame Street up there, right? So they've they've got a they've, they've got the culture on their side the culture the artificial culture that has been portrayed in American media is absolutely endorsing these people. That is I, I what I'm afraid sense. of. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, because I obviously have no lo love for either side. 
like the alt right obviously wants me dead, and the the fucking left are just annoying with their dumb yeah. microaggressions and like their stupid economic policies. So they're authoritarians, and yeah, they are dumb. I, I don't like so. either side at all. Yeah, I hate authority. I'm a libertarian. I fucking hate authoritarianism. <laughs> So, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I guess I don't know. Um, my my stepdad recommended that I listen to one of Sam Harris's podcasts, his recent one, because it's been going around. Everybody's been really liking it, which is really funny because I remember being, um, you know, like like a fourteen, fifteen year old new atheist, just like absolute, like insufferable person, right? Just like constantly, like, well, you know, actually. Right, with my little Sam Harris books being like, actually, I read this and blah blah blah, right? <laughs> and like everyone just like rolling their eyes at me, like, oh my god, he this fucking phase needs to end. It's like so terrible, right? And now I'm, it's like it's like 15 years later, and, <laughs> and my stepdad's like, hey, did you listen to the Sam Harris podcast? And I'm like, uh, no, actually, because that's not I hate him now, so I'm gonna listen to this and like. It, it was a fascinating thing to listen to because it's him addressing this whole race thing. And, like, Sam Harris, as far as his politics, tends to, like, take up every, like, obnoxious, basic bitch position, and it's, like, really tiresome. But to hear him break down, like, the BLM narrative and the racial stats and everything in this, like, pure explain-it-like-I'm-five, really, really slow like methodically paced insanely ludicrously sensitive thing just laced with all these concessions for blm where he's like trying to as gently as possible sneak in the little red pills and i'm like mm, if there's any hope for like reason to prevail in this situation we need a black man to just state this verbatim or sorry we, we, need, no, we need a black <laughs> lesbian to like state this verbatim to all of these like idiot far leftists who are protesting okay. that's like the I'm only gonna, I'm gonna say two things uh one do me a favor send me the link to that podcast uh <clears throat> oh, because sure. i've heard about this podcast that particular one and uh i heard I about it making sense i think is what it's making called. sense okay i'll look I mean, that up yeah, um, this up. this was talked about on brett uh brett and heather brett weinstein and heather hangs uh dark horse podcast they were talking about this, and they were also talking yeah, about the I heard Dave, them talking Dave Chappelle. About it. Oh shit, they're live right now. We're competing with them. <laughs> oh. I'm but not they, sure. They, they, they did talk about how it's a perception issue, and I think they're entirely right. And Sam Harris is right. Um, it is ultimately about we we it, it's we're a lot less objective. We're we're not looking at, at any real numbers. We're looking at what's in front of us what is put in front of us and who who is putting it in front of us so when you see a video and it's horrific and you see you're consistently seeing these videos you get the sense that it's happening more frequently and it's it's a much more dire situation and i'm not saying that it's not horrible it's not horrific police brutality is is not a terrible thing that we shouldn't be ending because we should and I, I would be the first to say that we need to reform the police uh, but it's not nearly as bad as we are as our perception of it and when people react to that perception it is a perfectly natural reaction so when people say that we we need change now or they say that we need to defund the police now i get why they're saying it we should and i, and I don't I'll hold that against them what's important though is that they maintain an objectivity take a step back and be like okay is it really as prevalent as what we're seeing and the reality is it's really not it's just that we're better at covering it when when it does happen anyway um i gotta go on in about a minute actually i'm sorry yeah well we've been going about about a couple of hours and yeah I'm, I'm yeah and i know you're going also to... I'm, I'm talking i have um i'm gonna be calling my my family because i guess they're meeting for like father's day so hmm. anyway oh. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in though, because I know you're going to hate me because I, I was watching a Mr. Dapperton video that I thought was okay, 
even though I, th- I know you hate Mr. Dapperton because he's being a I stupid drama horror. I don't hate him. I don't hate him. I'm just like critical, and I think he's cringy, and I like to make fun of him. But he's you know, <laughs> he he's is like... kind of cringy. But like he pointed out, like that the the the, the leftist demands in theory aren't necessarily that bad. Like defunding the police would be in theory a good thing if we had a way to replace them with like say private security, you know, or at the very least like lower the number of cops needed and no, replace yeah, them with yeah. private security and remember but, but then they don't back, want to fucking do that yeah. when i did the riot just wanna... stream i was like totally thinking like you know what yeah fuck them like go ahead defund it fuck it it can't be worse than the status quo but then it's like these retards are like handling this in the absolute worst conceivable way possible so it's like oh god like you're just like, and it's so it pisses me off so because... far <laughs> It pisses me off because they have the power to actually fucking like make private security like the like the majority of what enforcement right. would be. Can can I just stop you and say private security seems like a dumb idea because not everybody could afford private security. I don't think that's the solution. I think the solution instead is increase funding to police and that increased funding would go towards increased training and regular training on our police force so that they know how to de-escalate a situation. Uh, oh, you're going to love the Sam we... Harris link that I sent you. That's totally like a major part of his solution oh. building. Is like good, good. Wrapping up on their, their, um, and okay. So, so that's, that's the thing, right? Now, here's what really pisses me off though, is that all these people who want to defund the police, their whole thing is they're like, we need to have de-escalation. We need to, you know, not be so confrontational and not promote violence. And I'm sitting here like, Civil Rights Act of 1964, you literally made it illegal for Denny's to be racist. That is not de-escalation. That is literally escalation. De-escalation is like letting the racists go have their spaces to be privately racist by themselves. That would have been a de-escalating factor insofar as they think race is relevant here. Right? And it, yeah. and it, the the training thing, really, uh, someone yesterday mentioned this to me about the Atlanta thing. Like, the, the weird part about the struggle where he started fighting back, and they mentioned, the, if you are thinking about it in the in a way that they, they know that they can't use the chokehold anymore, which they were trained to use, it really explains how this man was able to overpower two, two police officers. And I'm not sure if that's correct, but it certainly raises a question, like, if, if you train people to do a certain thing like this uh, elbow chokehold if someone resists and then you tell them you can't do that anymore it's illegal now it kind of creates a situation where the police are thinking what what how how do i do this you know well yeah and like so on the point like that you were trying to make just in response because i think you said that um private security wouldn't be a good solution I, I guess like yeah you sort of have a point there because like not everyone would be able to afford it but then why not we combine that with the fact that let's get rid of all these stupid gun free zones where people can actually like conceal carry no i agree with that i think that more people should be armed because that's a deterrent if you know that everybody Deter- yeah. in in the, like, in the room like is going to be can... armed you're not going to go shooting them up you're not going to go right. robbing the store if you know that everybody in that store has a gun it's not like um, cops can go, pre- prevent that anyways immediately. True. Uh, another thing another thing to mention is uh, I heard someone else bring this point as well. Uh, in the case of uh, George Floyd, was it? No, no, I'm thinking of someone else. Uh, who's the guy that was drunk? This isn't Rashad. George Floyd. Brooks, Rashad something. Brooks in it? Atlanta. Brooks, yeah. So in his case, they could have called him an Uber. They decided to arrest him. That's where things got out of hand. Right, and he was already right. on probation. Yeah. So it was I've like seen the same thing kind of before with, with cops trying to arrest people for not wearing masks. How about you just give them a mask? That'll actually save the taxpayers a lot of money because it costs money to put someone in jail and process them, right? It costs a lot less money to buy them a mask. It costs a lot less money to get them a freaking Uber. So that would have been a good solution. Instead, the, the cops, they, they're... The problem I have with a lot of cops is they are, one, a brotherhood, and they look after each other, and no matter what happens, no matter what wrong they do, they can do no wrong. They look out for each other, and they cover each other's asses. And the other thing is they are, it's kind of the Stanford prison experiment, where they are 
a lot of them develop or they're trained to believe that it's us versus them. It's the, the ones that are enforcing order and then it's the ones that are breaking the law. And they stop looking at people as people. And when people resist them, when they talk back to them and they say, I'm not going to cooperate or I'm not going to do exactly what you tell me to do, or they, you, they physically don't do what you tell them to do, then they, they start getting aggressive. And that's the thing that we need training on. It's like, no, yes. cops should not be getting aggressive. Like, cop will well, actually get in someone's face just for someone uh, telling them to fuck off. I'm sorry, but no, cops should know better than that. That actually, yeah, but, ask, go ahead. No, sorry, I'm, I just think the situation right now, it created a sort of mix and match between George Floyd, which the i mean it happened to other people as well like the knee on the neck i think someone pointed out it was mossad technique to subdue persons and the atlanta thing where they had like 20 minutes where this guy was cooperative so they had no reason to uh, think that he was assist when they put the handcuffs on it was very spontaneous unexpected mm -hmm. actually like if, if someone is compliant for 20 minutes and the moment his handcuffs touch his hands, he starts wrestling down two cops. Doesn't justify using lethal force, but uh, the video itself is it's, it's mind-boggling to me. Like, this guy was out of jail for two weeks. Yeah. He was compliant. He they were respectful. He was respectful to whatever drunk person can be respectful. And the decision that he made to fight them in that moment. I well, will never said, understand that. You said that he was out of jail for two weeks. Yeah, the Brooks guy. Okay, so think about that. Like, think about he was what very that scared means. of going back to, he was to jail. Of going that, back that was to his jail trigger. Because you know what happens in jail. You 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 don't don't have any dignity. You're being taken out of the civilian population. You're subjected to one of the most hostile, torturous environments. Like, even prison rape. Prison rape isn't a bug. It's it's a feature of the system. They they let it happen. They even encourage that to happen. It sort of keeps people in line. And unfortunately, that's also one of the places where people radicalize. Like you'll have perfectly normal, uh, non-racist people go in and they come out like neo-Nazis, right? Because that's how they survive. And the people that that don't adapt like that and somehow maybe get out early, they are traumatized. They don't want to go back in. Maybe they made some Absolutely. enemies because they didn't play that game. Absolutely. Yeah. I just I just don't get why this terrible. person two weeks after he got out did that DUI in the first place. Like do you you need to cherish your freedom. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, terrible. I wanted to so th this um the argument that, you know, if we rely on private security, poor people can't afford it. There's one thing that's important to consider with that, and it has to do with, mm -hmm. um, like, for example, like, like if I have a home and I have, like, a private fire force, right, that's going to help my home if it's getting burned down. Well, I also don't want the, the house next to mine to get burned down either because that, that's also going to be, like, a risk, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I can kind True. of see this approach being that, like, you don't want any of this to happen in your community in general. And if people like truly believe, okay, having a force in our community that's going to help resolve these conflicts, um, you know, is going to be beneficial to my interest and it's worth paying for, then there's no reason that we can't voluntarily form police, right? Um, and, and it, I mean, so, so that there is kind of an, a, an ability to, to to make it a generalized enough thing that even people who can't necessarily afford to pitch in are still going to be able to benefit from other people saying, like, okay, I'll pay, you know, so that I'm defended if it's like near me or whatever. But I want I want to just ask you, what is the appeal to a private security like specifically? Is it because you just don't like how corrupt police are? Yeah, it's the incentive well, yeah. problem, right? Because you because, mentioned um, giving but out if, masks. If you could reform thing. police, if you could just redo police training and the whole system and just get them to do their jobs and not treat people like second-class citizens, you know. Well, then you're, they're basically to... private security then. 
or, but well, just why not just well the then the why not just do that? that make the, police the easiest private way security. to do that though is to make them private because well, well, yeah. then well, they're going to they be, be directly responsible to their customers at, rather than being paid for by the government. Oh, I get it. So ultimately, yeah. because they, they, well, in that case, all you, what you have to do is you have to, part of the training of what it means to be a police officer is that officer needs to recognize that they're ultimately beholden to the people they're serving. I mean, they are supposed to be serving and protecting, and I think maybe that's the principle that is completely lost. So that is something that they need daily reminders of, perhaps. Um, I, but I, I don't. I really just don't think that making uh, putting money into the situation is necessarily the right way to go. Like you know. Um, well, I think I remember hearing that because, like, I think uh, donut operator, this police YouTuber, he was pretty. He's a pretty good YouTuber. He, I think, he, I think he mentioned that, and like, yeah, um, I'd rather them get better training at least than. Just like get rid of them and have what what the fuck the leftists want or whatever because they obviously don't know what the fuck they're asking for. How about this? Like, thing, one, one, of the solution, one of the solutions I've heard people suggest is, what if you could vote out police officers? What if, what if the people actually had input on who's actually a cop? Then that would be some accountability, and the cops would be like, oh shit, I need to actually toe the line. I need to, you know. I need to please the people. Does that mean that they should just let them get by with infractions? No, but they, should, they still need to do their job, but stay favorable. And maybe some having some kind of civilian oversight would, would be the solution. But then I guess, it, what, well, what, what if it could be abused, though? Like, what, I mean, they, they, like what people are just like, like, that people checks just, like and retarded and just want, want them out because, hey, he looked at me funny or something. You know what I mean? Uh, well, uh, you could do that. Yeah, like a hundred drug dealers move force. into a neighborhood, and then they all just like block vote against certain cops. Yeah, but 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 so I kind of like, kind of like Twitter, where where someone has a poll online. It's like, oh shit, someone's got a poll. Let's skew that thing entirely so that we can embarrass the shit out of them. Exactly, that's my but, concern. But but the, the concept is interesting, right? I don't know. Like voting... the guy who put his neck on the guy's neck, uh, his knee on the guy's neck. He had done shit. Like I think twenty offenses, and he was still on the job. Like that shouldn't have happened. Yeah. Actually, um, plot twist on that. Um, apparently, using your knee as like a chokehold. Apparently, there is some, some like like, uh, instruction, older instruction like related to that. I guess. There's a lot yeah, of they shit get, that's gonna they come get out of training this from Mossad case. agents to do that. That's a technique from Krav Maga. I think yeah, it's Israel as well. I think they get trained in Israel. Um, and then, well, the other thing too is that um, a lot of, I guess his his uh, his records. I think a lot of it might be like unsubstantiated accusations. But basically, what's going to ha seem to happen is um, there's a good chance Derek Chauvin is going to end up being declared innocent. And that's if gonna they do, there's going to be worse yeah. rights than there oh, have been this be, whole time. It's going to be insane. It. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be off the freaking. The, the the alternative is to throw him to the wolves, which they may very well do, just to save the peace. Right, but then that's going to cause cops just to fucking leave in mass, and well, I don't blame. The, they're more likely to leave in mass corn. anyway. Like uh, a lot of them. Right, but that's going to definitely make it like even worse because like they're literally well, going to be killed by the state that they're supposed to be working for. Sure. Um, so I think that a lot of them are like I've already heard a lot of them are already resigning as it is. Yeah, I already told because... my friend to, to fucking just, to just resign if that happens and they like, become a private security officer, who's a police officer because I don't want him fucking dying even if I yeah. disagree with him. So yeah, but anyway, still, I got to Security is just monetarily problematic. But hey, lovely talking to you, Jadis. Have a Likewise. great time. I had a good yeah. time as well. Jadis, thank you for coming on. I thought that you brought a lot to the conversation. Um, and usually, whenever I'm streaming, if I see a familiar face who I know is someone who's like interested in hopping on, I'll send you the link. So, any okay. anytime you're in the neighborhood, <laughs> if you're, you you want to hop on, let me know, and I'll, I'll send you Wait. the link. If I yeah, can, I'll be happy talking. to join. Yeah, no, no problem. All right, you guys have a great day. You too. too. Happy Father's thank Day you. to your to your father also. Oh, thanks. I'll, I'll tell him that. Right. Have a good day. Bye. <laughs> That's actually a thing I do that um, when it's a holiday, I forget that you're supposed to only say the happy thing to like the person who is relevant to. Like on Mother's Day, I would just wish everyone a happy Mother's Day. 
<laughs> and people would be like, I'm yeah. a man. And I'm like, yeah, but you can what, still have what, a happy Mother's Day. I'm having a happy Mother's Day. Fuck you. Right? <laughs> oh, no, but that's, uh, why, why, would, why would that be a problem? Like, well, it's, you have it's, a no, shitty it's, mother. It's not, it's not a problem. Sucks. It's just it's just awkward. Like, if I say happy Mother's Day to you, it's like, are you telling me I'm a mother? And I was like, no, I just mean, like, you should enjoy Mother's Day. Like, everyone should. Right? But then I realized, oh, you're supposed to only say that to, to mothers. <laughs> yeah, this, this oh, is that. I didn't know that. Statism, Derek. Yeah. Because uh, I was saying Happy Father's Day to Jadis, then I realized, like, oh, she's not a father. I have to be her. She's like, thanks. That's funny. Anyway, that was a thing that I, I ran into because I worked at Hallmark and I was, like, also awkward. So that was a great combo. But isn't it currently, like, an LGBTQ month? Yeah, it's well? supposed to be gay month. <laughs> What, huh. Why did they? Why did they choose the month for Father's Day to do that? I don't know. Maybe it's intentional. Who knows? It's obviously a, a Zionist agenda. Clearly, yeah, to make the, all the dads. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know. Like, they probably have some historical thing. I hope that just happened to be in this month. But I don't get month things either. Like, uh, I'm I'm very much on Morgan Freeman's side with that. Like, why should that thing be relegated to a month? Yeah, it's retarded. Um, I have a bunch of people. So, so Chadwick Moore tweeted out about how like people are trying to make Juneteenth a thing for blacks, right? And he was like, "How come they're colonizing my month?" And I joked like, "Oh, why can't we just keep the month separate?" Ob like an obvious like separatism joke and they have these all these fucking white bitch karens up and they've been like uh -oh. actually actually didn't you know you it was the black month first and blah 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 and i'm just like god you're so freaking retarded i like you should link it to me i hate them all what's so it? much on Twitter or Facebook? i don't even want the notifications anymore i just want them to go away they're all like the worst people and they're so humorless and low iq i just want them all to like stop being is this on Facebook? Stop being here. No, it's on Twitter. Oh, but link it to me. I want to see. I want to get some kecks out of it. I need to like change my IP so I can actually make a new Twitter account. Like, I need to do that because that 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 site is fucking hilarious because it's all just like retarded leftists because it's like so the right horrible. people just get. I hate everything about it. It's because I think it's because they like all the right people like just get fucking censored. That so they're either banned or just don't fucking um, <laughs> care to get. Uh, uh, censored anymore you know what i mean i'm i'm just i'm current my main on facebook is banned because i called an sjw a retard and that happened literally <laughs> like like two days before all the chaz now chop shit happened so i'm sitting here like okay i'm banned but i'm like literally the most vindicated person ever uh, pff, i would tra trade you uh getting facebook bans with discord bans because, like, I'll say, like, anything, like, remotely fucking controversial or in something, or I'll get... The last time I got fucking banned was because the server that I was in was retarded and did something bad, and I had nothing to do with it. And I got still fucking nuked. So, yeah. like, Discord will literally you, you fucking nuke my account getting for anything You nuked on Discord, man. You, so, you're, you're the lord of getting banned from Discord at this I point. know. I would, I would trade yeah, with you, like but ridiculous. I don't think you'd like you need it. To stop. <laughs> Okay, so but, I, uh, I, I just to uh, yeah. just to uh, to say something. Uh, it was burning on my tongue. I, I still can't remember the meme because it kept doing the yeah, actually okay. the thing. thing. Is, the thing is, is that if I keep getting banned, I'm just gonna stay in space banned Discord and everyone else's Discord that I trust. I'm not gonna join anymore Discord because I don't. I can't fucking take it anymore. That reminds like, me. I, I can't to give at least one people. other person mod powers in my Discord so that in case I get banned, then it'll not die forever. But I, I can just make yeah, like like, like what happened in my Discord. Yeah, like every fucking... single time you, you end up in a new body, I have to toss you an invite to your own fucking server. Yeah. It's like, like the body, doctor of this possess, story. Like, like Emperor Palpatine. No, no, it's more hey, like it's Doctor nice Who. it's nice to see Jen's here. So, Jen, we've been going on a couple of hours, and I was probably going to wrap it up soon, but I'm glad that you've hopped in, because um, maybe, maybe we can pick your brain and get your thoughts on the masculine and feminine and in um it, it, i don't know if you if you if you looked into this this these stoltenberg essays it's fine if you didn't because i i you know i expect that they're, they're fucking awful so i don't blame anyone for not reading them but if you did if you had anything that like stood out to you um or if not otherwise just like any thoughts on approaches to defining the masculine versus the feminine are they useful concepts if so how do we define them 
stuff like that. Hey guys. Oh hi. Hello. Nice to see you. Um, I really enjoy these streams. You guys are really chill, so it's it's great to be able to catch up. Awesome. Do I have thoughts on masculine and feminine? Uh, the way I see it is, uh, God, give me some tough questions today, man. Yeah, and I just threw a bunch at you like immediately. <laughs> um, yeah. the way I look at it is, ah, oh, it's a very it's important to do uh, self exploration and uh, know yourself really well, and when you do that. You realize that there's attributes of yourself that are either archetypal or unusual. And so, uh, you know, there's sort of like a, an archetypal man, an archetypal woman, right? And people will fit into those molds with varying accuracy. And uh, basically what the tradition says is that you want to be the best version of yourself rather than like a crappy version of someone else. So it's always about knowing yourself. And then other than that, marriage is basically like a, I don't want to poo poo love, but ma marriage is basically a merging of assets and should be looked upon as such. And raising children should be looked upon as a serious endeavor of like, not just a vanity thing. And uh, I think it's important for men to have man only spaces. And it may be important for women to have women-only spaces, but I think it's more important for men. And other than that, I don't really know because it's just sort of like individual. So it's on an individual basis. Well, the women-only yeah. spaces aren't really under threat that much. Yeah, no, no, nobody has. I don't think anyone takes issue with with those so much. But um, it is interesting because I think that in general. Um, on the stream overall, a lot of us, like, like since we're, we all kind of have a, a libertarian bent to us, none of us want to come in and say, like, this is what masculinity is. This is what femininity is. So it's interesting that we have that common thread. Because um, I feel like that is the only way to approach it, right? Is you kind of keep it as like an open world. Maybe there's some rough guidelines, right? We look at the way that men and women act, and then we try to say, well... These are some characteristics we're seeing that are tend to be like really virtuous for whatever reason or by whatever standard, or we're seeing these clusters of behavior. Um, and I think that what Jadis brought to it was kind of an approach that's very much about like having the right mean, right? Of like, sometimes things are too much or too little and we should be sensitive to that. Whereas, um, interestingly, Jennifer, what you mentioned, it's, it's like almost more platonic, right? Of like, you have this, this concept of like a general form of what the ideal is and that there's a little bit of a, um, a, a of a, a balancing act between like, uh, respecting those forms while also like kind of identifying your own form. So I don't know. It, it's, it's, it is a tricky question. I mean, the, the easy cop out is what do you have to do? What are, what are the things that make it uh, impossible to find a, a mate? But what are the things that if you don't do them, the chance of you procreating, having uh, children get closer to zero rather than one? Right, but that would be a very like natalist approach, right? Because you could, in theory define femininity and masculinity from an anti-natalist perspective, which would be purely, like, selfish and individualized. Yeah, that's why I call it a cop-out, you know? <laughs> I, think, I think if you want a wife, then the best thing to do is, is to learn female psychology, because I find a lot of guys uh, project, like, everybody projects, which is, like, where you assume other people basically think things through the same way you do. And women and men essentially look at the world differently, and I kind of, like, reduce this to um, sexual organs. Like, for your sexual organs to be outwardly facing versus inner facing has a predictive influence on your behavior. 
That's why Actually, men. I've, like, I've heard a lot of um, people in MGTOW circles say something similar. Is that they're 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 sitting there saying like, how come women are thinking this or thinking that? How come they're not acting this way? And it's like because you're you're you're, you're assuming that they're thinking like a man, and they don't. Yeah, but uh, the other thing is like, have I ever talked to you, uh, space Baron like Derek? Have I ever mentioned Simon Baron Cohen to you? We've been talking a lot. You know, Simon Baron Cohen, cousin of this uh, Borat guy who studies babies' behaviors shortly after birth to find gender differences. Hey, that was in Borat? I don't remember that. Borat? No, no, it, it, oh, it's, it's, his, the guy it's, it, it's his cousin, Simon oh, Baron Cohen. Oh, He's a scientist. Okay, okay. I was like, wait, what? Borat, uh, Bo no, in Borat, he adopts a black child and name, names him Gaby or something. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I love that movie. It's just that the, the comedian slash actor has a cousin who is a behavioral scientist. And he does all of these. Like he, First, he studied like animal babies and the different reactions to objects and impulses. And he got a lot of shit for studying like, like he he's the source for female babies react on average more to faces and people and male babies react more to like mobiles and uh, mechanical things on average i actually have heard that that in general although the concept is kind of funny because like if you've ever like interacted with babies like they struggle with things like 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 sustaining the weight of their massive heads and like shit like that, you know? So the idea that like, we're getting like much like definitive, like behavioral observations from them. I don't know. It's just interest, you know? only interest behaviors. Like he, he put objects into the field of vision where they, they can focus. I think for babies, that's very, very uh, small difference, a uh, distance. And, uh, he observed, uh, average bias towards different things and he got a lot of shit for that because that implies that a female or male baby already is different even though people assume like in certain circles that you're completely malleable flesh with no inherent genetic or gender-based thing going on for you and therefore his studies were shunned yeah, well, because it's a major problem for people who want to do, like, the, the high, top-down, social constructivist narrative of everything, in particular with gender, right? They, they need everyone to be a blank slate, and they need society to define, like, literally everything. So I can definitely see how that, you know, causes a problem for them. Yeah. I just never saw the problem, like, society can still influence you one way or another. Even right, like, it's not thing. like it's a completely, it's not like it, it, it is as bad as it as they say it is or as um as um influence as influential as, as it is usually because it can still be you know socially and you can still be socially influenced to uh have all these different characteristics it's just to say that there's no like influence when it comes to sex uh, on your behavior is kind of also being a little bit dishonest you know, it's kind of like the same oh, thing yeah. with race. It's like I said, like, like I'd say white supremacists take it too far and say that there's like no, like they'll say that, oh, it completely influences the behavior. I'm I'm sort of like of the idea that, yeah, it might, if race might influence your behavior to a degree, but that even that would also fucking piss off a leftist or, a, you know, someone with... It's that actually a really complicated mindset. question. That's why people yeah. get like really immature about it. And like you get mm -hmm. these idiots who are just like, well, you know, you wouldn't have anything without white people. And it's like, have you seen, like, literally anywhere else in the world? Like, it's absurd. It's because it's actually a very complicated question because, like, within a race, there's a significant amount of variation. And then between races, there's also variation. And they're overlapping, in a way, mm -hmm. in certain ways. Yeah, and also, like every like, race has question. their black people within their own race. <laughs> And there's karma, right? <laughs> so the way I think of karma is like, uh, I, I don't know how a good model for it, but it's something that some people have more of and some people have less of. So if you have a lot of it, 
uh, it's harder to be influenced. And then if you have not so much of it, you're more of a like tabula rasa, like they say, which is the blank slate model. So it's like on a continuum. So the blank slate model is more true for some people and for other people, it's like not true at all. But it's it's only ever a little bit true because we do have this like inner self that the things that happening to us outside is bouncing off of. It's not just like we're a, a suitcase that experiences perpetually flow into for all time, right? Wait, so I'm sorry, I missed the first part. You said that if you have more karma, then you're less of a blank slate. And if you have less karma, you're more of a blank slate. Yeah, good karma. Because like the way we look at it is it takes time to get more intelligent. Like you have to work at something and work at it and get better and better. And then that builds like momentum. So when you have all this momentum from all this knowledge, in, in physics, momentum is conserved, right? So yeah, you get reincarnated. That sort of changes the momentum because like, I guess you have to go through this like teeny tiny little baby again, but you still have residual momentum and that'll uh, influence your ability to learn, your ability to talk, your ability to locomote. It really just depends on what you retain. And some people don't retain that much because their consciousness is just more simple, simplistic, like the MPC meme, right? Sure. So they'll, they'll have some, I don't think you could say no, that anybody doesn't have a personality but you could say that some people have like a more complex personality than others. And those people with the more complex personality, they have less potential to be influenced. I see. Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm still skeptical on the, on the whole concept of, of karma, but, um, I, 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 my question was, so. Uh... Was it a question? Like it, it was kind of trying to exclude that aspect by virtue of uh, it being controversial. Like uh, most people don't believe in karma, but uh, most people experience differences between male and female. Therefore, it's easier to talk about that. Well, and whether we're talking about like inherent biological differences or talking about um, like, like factors that you could call karma, right? Like like having knowledge or having experience. Um, I think that insofar as you can kind of like measure out or map out some of those factors, um, then, then I can see how, you know, you can make um, like, like certain judgments based on like how, you know, the, the masculine and feminine are, are defined at least by like observation, If that makes sense. It, it, to me, it does. But I think if um, if karma is a big factor in how you analyze things, obviously these factors are secondary. Like, uh, I, I think, Jen, you said that you reincarnated from a male to female. Therefore, the male-female dichotomy doesn't apply that much. Only, like, only a master could do that. That the point, the point of doing it is to prove that it's extremely difficult to do. Not that it's just like, oh, I'm going to be a woman today. I'm going to be a man today. Like, it does not work like that. Like, for most people, such a feat would be impossible. But uh, it's not. It's not quantum mechanically impossible but you have to identify basically with an, your identity has to transcend your physicality to be able to do it and most people that's not the case so it's like again it's a what do you call it a, a not a spectrum but a continuum so it's like most people are really identified with their body and and then some people are a little less and then a little less and then at the end of that the other end of that spectrum, you have people are just fully identified with their spirituality and when they could do stuff like that. But mostly, I think you just stay. The idea is that you're you're basically as similar to your past self as biologically possible. Well, and yeah, it's kind of interesting because I think about things like that. And like, for example, people like to say, um, oh, what if you woke up the next day and you were the opposite gender? And a lot of people, I think they'd have like an identity crisis over some immutable characteristic like that changing. But I imagine like just not even caring that much, like no, at all. The answer is masturbation, obviously. Well, I mean, obviously I'm, that, that's, I'm sorry, but the first thing anyone would do when faced with this impossible situation is, I mean, come on. 
they, they, they'd say masturbate, obviously. Um, and then if they don't say masturbate, then you just know they're lying. It's, it's like peeing in the shower, you know? Why is there even a taboo against that? Do people not realize that it's actually good for fighting foot fungus? Ew. Yeah. What no. is, <laughs> what's, what's more disgusting? Urinating on your feet or having a foot fungus? I know, I know what my I answer. mean, I, I don't have foot fungus problems with my I mean, feet. I just don't pee in the toilet. I don't, I don't either, but it's a preventative measure. It just never occurred to me that I should pee in the shower. <laughs> well, actually, I will I mean, okay, say I did it best, once. Um, I did it once just to see how it feels. Guys, like a fifteen-year-old or something. But guys, you gotta liberate yourselves. Red Raptor stop, says, stop "Save listening. water, don't flush." He's 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 a if it's yellow, leave it mellow kind of guy. Yeah, I don't I don't believe in that because the smell. <laughs> I, I never I never peed in the shower because. I usually go to the toilet before I take a shower. Like not as a rule, not because I think it's gross. It just never it never occurred to me that I should like it would be an intentional choice for me to pee in the shower. Because oh, I usually dear. just go when I need to go. Not keep it in until I need to take a shower. My problem is, like, my shower, is, it's just, like, an open thing. Like, my whole bathroom is, like, the shower. I just have, like, a showering thing on it. So I, I don't like to pee in my current shower because that's, like, peeing all over my bathroom floor. Mm, I've only I mean, done it once. It all and drains, I was, like, teenager. But... It's like... Okay, I'll say a yeah. prayer that you guys may enjoy the blisses of shower peeing. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, feel free. <laughs> you got to live your life. Uh, it, it relates back to the thing I tried to say earlier when space was, is, keep going to this sentence. Actually, I still can't remember the the exact quote. Like someone That's was saying, but, I love uh, that. That's but, like uh, gay people don't do that because they're not fucking assholes. And the response was actually, actually. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sorry, it's still funny to me. Uh, like after five years after first seeing that, I would laugh. But like that's pretty funny. I sent you the meme on uh, Twitter, and it, it's like con ops personified. Like con ops is literally that meme in human form. Oh yeah, this guy, actually. I just need a moment to save it. Oh, I, I can't, you can't, I can't ever save things from Twitter because it like loads it, the, the PNGs in like sizes. And it just makes me want to die. You have to open the image in a separate tab and remove all the bullshit after the JPEG or PNG. Oh, is that the trick? And it loads correctly. Oh, I see. Yeah, why does Twitter do that? Oh, it's so freaking like, annoying. On their, on their site. Like, it, I've it been shadow banned on Twitter forever. Of, it's a little less data that they have to send you from the server. But actually, converting the image to all these different sizes creates more energy consumption than sending you the full size image in the first place. So. No, it's but like it gives a, me a 404 when I do that. But it's the dude that says, actually... The picture. Yeah, that, that that 2011 meme. Ah, it's a good one. Memes were better back then. Okay, boomer. Bring back paint memes. Hey. I use paint. I never. I never let go of paint memes. I still make them. I have been doing the same meme format for a while. But I agree with you. There was like a period. I don't know if it was before, right before, or right after Trump, where memes were just like freaking awesome and they kind of got like i think what happened is like some professional companies started like quote memeing which diluted the meme pool with like some more i don't know some less edgy memes i always thought like it was that the left just opted out because they thought everyone who was memeing was far right 
Like they, they used to be very balanced memes, like right wing memes, left wing. Memes. Didn't even think of them as that. There was just memes. Yeah. And this this meme that the left camp meme. I don't know how that came to be, but it is true. I have I'm on a bunch of left wing reddits, and they are not funny. I don't it's know why. They base, it's because they get offended. <laughs> well, and like, what a what an idiotic sort of PR campaign or like propaganda approach that was was to say, um, memeing is a right wing thing, and it's only the right people who are doing that. It's like you retards, like you just literally. <laughs> yeah, and then everyone fucking forgot that, about that, and now like everyone uses the funny tapping. and edgy and and countercultural is on the right, and it's taken the left many years to start to counteract that narrative. <laughs> Logic of the fascist guy. Yeah. I only really, really like the memes that come out of 4chan nowadays because, like, everyone else is just fucking boring. Like, the NPC meme came out of 4chan, I think. Was that from 4chan? Well, it I'm came sure. from a study that's actually um, pushing a decade old, but, like, it didn't become... It was, like, the information was out there, but then it sort of coalesced into a meme. I'm not sure. I, I covered it on my blog when it happened, but it was, like, one to two years ago. Yeah, like, there's literally a Reddit called The Right Can't Meme. Like, talk about being butthurt, right? Uh -huh. It's just, uh, I think the epitome is um, Stone Toss is a Nazi Reddit. Wait, where they, like, you know Stone Toss, the guy? He is sort of, like, he, yeah, he yeah, does he, have some theories he, that are about the Holocaust that might be construed as that, but, like, <laughs> yes, but but the, the issue I'm raising is that there's a Reddit where they try to repurpose his comics to make their own memes, and I've watched I've, I've probably seen like a thousand of them by now, and only one made me slightly chuckle, not even a nose exhale. Like, I like Stone Toss's uh, circumcision comics because they're all he's always anti circumcision. Those are just gold. Like he, yeah. he's he's brilliant. Because he he that. points out like how fucking like barbaric and like retarded like the, the, like the Zionist Jews that actually do it or like the Orthodox Jews, like because it's literally just basically this fucking pedophile looking ass like with a bloody beard. <laughs> so like saying, oh yeah, you think thank thank you for getting rid of those religious radicals after the guy like sits or like shuts a door on like a what was it what what are those Christians that. Come to your door. Oh, Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's, yeah, like those guys are radical, but not the guy um, literally fucking sucking a baby's cock after he mutilated it. So the the one that yeah, I, I know like about that. is um the one where it's like consent in three different panels in different situations, and then the last uh, one is the woman handing the baby. Circumcise the baby. Yeah. yeah, because women are retarded. So. I think that's my favorite one. I just but say yeah, memes, Derek. Sorry? And this, like, style of meme was big, like, ten years ago, and I, I think it's probably the best style of meme. I just sent you two of them. I don't know Korea, what you would just Korea call Korea Man it. says that, um, that, that, that memes are cringe and awful, which he kind of has a point, but... I'm sorry, but they can be that's, good. like, cringe. That's, like, insect tear take. I'm sorry, but it's not are all you memes. Saying are saying that <laughs> Asian? You think he's a bug person? That is not a racist comment. That is, <laughs> that is me literally reading that guy's comments and coming to the conclusion that he's a shill. That he is an insect. And no. that he behaves like it is a human Damn. sized insect. No. Is not a that's that's more offensive, in my he's, opinion, he's like being called an insect. Of, he's a friend of both <laughs> of our channels. He's, he's, yeah. He's constantly We're... counter signaling India, which is, I understand that this is a, a pro China stream so it's all good you know i just i what can i In say essence, he's, maybe. Not, he's not my biggest fan oh my god yeah, i love getting... with the puppy in the stairs oh my god isn't it so cute like oh it's like god. what is the name for this type of meme it's like da 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 you know with the hamster like it's the i guess irreverent maybe is the um, word or like um, absurd oh yeah well it's almost like um it's like it's like still image animation right because it's the same image but zoomed in but it has that dramatic effect to it. I like the I one think where it was the from a Japanese the puppy, show. And then there's the sad cat in the background. Like, that's one of my favorites, too. Sad cat. Yeah, that made me depressed the first time I saw it. So. Yeah, no, I want a puppy. I want a puppy so bad. 
I, I still don't understand why memes in general become much more simple. Like, uh, it's weird. Like, I think it's the, because, like, there's more things to be offended about. So, like, because even compared to 2016, like, there's more things to be offended about now since, like, left has gone, like, completely fucking insane. So well, maybe the there's other, less people wanting to actually even take the risk. Maybe. The other stereotype is that leftist memes have, like, just a whole bunch of text. There, there, there's a well, that, that is That's very true. common. That is very common. Wit and gravity, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, think about it like this, okay? What I, I postulate here that part of what makes a meme good is how much information it conveys versus how much information it contains. And so yes. I think this can be said for enormously simplistic, which still conveys a very complex message, that that, being able to do that, like lose complexity of the image without complexity of the message is part of the art of meaning. And that's what the left doesn't understand because for them, it's never about the simplest explanation. It's always about my feels. And that just yeah. doesn't translate to a meme. <laughs> Like, Actually, a uh, friend of mine who co who's called Leo the Animal Tittle Lover said the exact same thing. It's about density. Like if if you uh, if you need to know the meme format for it to work, you've kind of failed. If you need a lot of words, you've kind of failed. If someone sees this image with that text, and it instantly conveys a mes message. Then you have succeeded. Yeah, I guess text on your meme—it's kind of like Scotch tape, right? And 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 if you're making a good craft, you know you want the tape to be as seamless as possible. But sometimes you got to use a lot of Scotch tape. Yeah, but um, <laughs> this 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 like the, they they actually made a meme about memes having tires. You know, like uh, first tire meme is uh. Something that a normie would get. Second tire meme is you have to have some contacts, and there's like 11th tire memes where you basically had to have been in the movement, if you could call it that, for like the last nine years. Those um, are the best. That's called that's called a dog whistle. Okay, guys, that's a dog whistle. I've got I've got one for you. I just sent you a science meme that I hope you like, and I've got another one that I think you're gonna find is funny. I will be right back. The same, actually. I probably should have loaded up this part of the screen on on here. I'm like, but... I'm like, I could, I could geek out about memes for like hours. I absolutely love studying memes because, like, it sort of goes to how we perceive information and how we like think, because like. I mean, well, this one's just interesting. Really thing. The quantum like, field what? one is just interesting. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I thought it was like, it was when Duvid was having his like freak out about coronavirus. So I thought I would try to like bring some science to it. And uh, I thought that was interesting. And then do you see the last one I sang? Yeah, this, this ancient Karenism. <laughs> that one fine day, Lady Karen began her journey to seek out the manager. Your powers are useless in these lands, Karen. Retreat, lest I release the dogs upon thee. <laughs> I also love how, like, with so much old art, the people are, like, proportioned in, like, really ridiculous ways. That's another thing I love to study is art history. Like, we have had some amazing art over the years, and then some absolutely, like, ridiculous art and it would be cool to like know why sometimes they were because i'm imagining that this one here is really simple because it's stitched onto a fabric yeah it's it's uh, not not easy to get the precision there but okay so the whole thing with like people like oh like da vinci would dissect people so that he could make better art i don't fucking buy that i think he was just a morbid fuck and he just like needed an excuse you know what I mean? Like, 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 you don't need to fucking cut open a body to like be able to do your art better. Like, I zero percent believe that. I'm not an artist, I but I, I, I totally I cut doubt up a corpse it. in my last life. It's oh. not that weird. For a, I think you know, it's pretty weird. Lion. I think that's weird. I've seen cadavers in this life. They are a little bit 
the weird thing about cadavers is that the people who work around them are so remarkably comfortable around them. Yeah, they like kind of have to be. I lean on one once. I was like, I was listening to um. Well, I think it's Mark Hughes. Mark? Yeah, I want to be comfortable with that. Honestly, I think that's well, like kind of fucked he, up. He did an but... interview on his podcast with a comedian who also works in a morgue, and like she's really funny. <laughs> But yeah, that's I don't know. But she had she had funny like morgue jokes and shit. Yeah. I should find that link. That was a pretty. That is a good show. I don't know. If, I don't think he's done anyone recently. I, I haven't seen it pop up. I'll have to check that out. But um. Anyway, I actually I think I have to get going now because I have um I'm gonna I'm gonna call my. My family because I think they're having like a dinner or whatever for Father's Day. So then I can Ooh, talk to yeah, them yeah. before I like go to sleep because the sun's risen here. And that's, that's Thanks for business. having me. It was really great catching up with you guys. I look forward to seeing everyone again. Yeah, 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 it was good having you on here. And of course, as usual, if I see you in the chat, I'll, I'll be tossing you the link. So anytime. Thank you. Take care now. All right, everybody. Okay. Everyone have a nice day. Have a good day. time, everyone. Yeah, keep it easy. Bye-bye.